Well, good afternoon. Welcome to our first Legislative Tech Facilities and Process meeting of 2022. Um, I start out, I guess we should call the roll. If you would go ahead and do that, Ashley. Yep, uh, Senator Cost. Here. So, are you unmuted, sir? I took it off a minute. Oh. Uh, Give me just a sec. We'll see. Yes. Can you try are again? You, are you still not hearing me? Yep, we got you. Thank you. Okay, I am here. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Steinmetz. Here. Representative Wilson. Representative Yin. Uh, Co-chairman Case. Co-chairman Zwanitzer. Here. You have a quorum. Chairman Wilson should be here momentarily as well. Uh, Representative Yin is at a legislative conference and I do not believe is able to join us today as he's touring. Can't remember what facility, but it sounded impressive and secretive. So uh, with that, first up this morning or this afternoon, um, welcome Ms. Madsen. Uh, you're here to talk about facilities and wayfinding and updates on the Capitol building. Anything else you'd like to share with this committee? Floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I'm actually going to start by turning it over to Jamie because he recently presented our first topic to um, a meeting of the National Conference of State Legislatures Information Technology staff, and it uh, went over very well. So I thought Jamie might be the best position to uh, walk you through a new system we have upstairs, and then I will explain how that system fits in the larger exhibit and wayfinding project. All right. Welcome, Mr. Chubb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Madison, Wisconsin and presented at the NALIT conference, which is the IT staff for all the state legislatures. And they have a segment within there every year called Five Minutes of Fame. And so this won't be a long presentation. I did it in less than five minutes there, but uh, it was received well. And I had probably three or four different states come up and talk to me about it afterwards, about what we did. Um, I don't know if you have noticed, uh, but up on the second floor and third floor right outside of the lobbies, there are larger kiosks up there now. And from those kiosks, you can find different information about what's happening in the building. And for instance, if this meeting right here is now, if you're up on the second floor, you can find directions down to this room. And then outside of each meeting room, I believe there's 10 meeting rooms in the Capitol, six in the extension, these two rooms here on the first floor, the historic Supreme Court and the G Joint Appropriations Committee room, there's a tablet outside of the room that will show the information about the meetings that are going to happen in that room. So what I'm going to demo for you today, though, is from the kiosk, the 43 inch um, screen not the tablets, but um, just talking briefly about the tablets. If you're in session and walked up to the room back in the day, you know, we would print off a piece of paper and have it on the door and it would show what bills are going to be heard for that committee is if you walk up to the kiosk and um, ask for more information about the meeting as a touch panel, it would then show you the bill information that's going to be displayed on that. And that's I'm not going to demo that, but that's how the tablets work. Um, and you can notice that actually outside this room, if you walk out of this room after the meeting and see that this meeting was occurring right now. Um, one, one brief thing that I will say about those tablets too, I don't know if you have noticed them because they've been in the Capitol now for probably like six months or so, but if a meeting is occurring in the room, there's like side lights on the tablet that shows if the room is um, available or not. So. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong in the callers, but I believe if a meeting is not happening, it would be green. And if it's um, busy, like right now, if you like look at that tablet, you would see a red light on there that shows that something's happening. Yeah, you guys can walk out of the room and take a look at that. But um, so I will share my screen and walk you through the demo of what's on the kiosks that any any member of the public when they join or not join, but they come here and visit during session or not, they can find this type of information.
might have to go full screen. We can change the zoom. Is that too small? So on the kiosks up there, we have like four categories down at the bottom where you can see a building map of the Capitol. And within here, you can see the different extensions and you can't really do this, but there's a touch extension to swipe. So you can like see the different like layouts from different floors. The other thing that we have, and this is what I think the public would find useful is when meetings are happening, especially during the session, is if you go into the meeting directory and right now we have facilities, technology and process this meeting and um, it, it also shows you the meeting for corporations that's going to be happening. But what's really cool about this feature is if you're at the kiosk and want to know where that room is, if you're not really familiar with this building, is if you click on this information thing and on for their purposes, they're using their finger and it's just a touch screen. But watch like the line. And so I'm like going from the second floor lobby, going to the elevator and you see the line going down this meeting room in 110. And um, you can see exactly the path that you would take to get to the room. Uh, we, we have explored other options and might upgrade to this, but if you, there's the ability where you can um, receive step-by-step -step directions through your phone, if you want that. We, we have not done that yet, but we've looked at that possibility and you punch in your cell phone number and you would then receive a text that would say, get on this elevator, go down to the first floor, make a right, and you would have step-by-step -step directions. Um, the points of interest within the building for the public that comes here, you can see all the different areas that we have. Um, but for instance, I'll show you what like that map looks like to get down to the extension. The auditorium's a good example of that. So if I click the location thing on the you could see where we're at on the second floor in capital level two and the dot, then you like get down to the garden level and the dot goes to the extension. I'm not sure, oh, there comes the extension and then you walk down here. So if anybody in the public wants to know how to access one of these rooms from doing that, they would be able to do it from the second or third floor. Wendy's gonna get this into a little later, but I in the larger scope of the exhibits and wayfinding that she's doing with the executive branch, these kiosks might pro possibly move to the first floor where the public comes in. But right now it's just legislative wayfinding, not building wayfinding, if you will. Um, one other thing on this is on the points of interest. If you want to have information about a room, like the um, say the house chamber, if the public touches the kiosk and does information, we have a picture on each one of the locations within the Capitol with a short um, description about like, for instance, the house chamber. One other thing I might add is down here, there's a QR code. So if the public wants to scan that QR code with their phone, they can pull the same information that you're seeing here up on their phone and be able to do the same steps. Um, right now we've added elected officials here, but since this is for legislative wayfinding, what you have here is all the representatives and senators, and it's the same information that's on the website about um, the profiles that you have all submitted to us. And if you click on an individual legislator, it would bring up that information about them. And then you can just go through, like this is an alphabetical order right now, um, but you could select representatives, senators, and all that type of thing. If you wanna have information about the legislator from your county or your district where you live back um, around the state. Um, I'm not sure if there's really much more to demo on this. Um, Wendy, is there anything you would like to add? Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that we could probably transition into how this fits into the larger project as well as some of the other ways that uh, this particular portion can be built out if you're ready to move on or if you have any questions about the basic system. Questions, committee? <clears throat> okay, no, I think it's very impressive, but 
Um, thank you, Jamie, and we'll move to the next topic. Oh, good. <laughs> that is great to hear. Um, Mr. Chairman, so we'll transition into the larger exhibit and wayfinding project, but um, this particular legislative portion, um, just to give context to why it happened first, is this um, concept had been a goal of the oversight group at the closeout of the Capitol Square project in 2019, and there was not enough funds remaining, but there was sufficient interest in uh, the legislative branch to go ahead and proceed by putting an appropriation into the feed bill. So this portion of the project effectively kind of got started before appropriations were even made for the larger exhibit and wayfinding portion. So we learned a lot of things through this um, and some tweaks. A couple of uh, tweaks from what Jamie showed you that I think we'll continue to develop as staff and uh, Jamie and his IT team were involved in this, as was Rihanna Davidson and Anthony Sarah. So it really had a lot of, um, uh, of different scopes of visitor services needs for Rihanna, um, everything that Jamie's group tries to show to the public for meetings during session in the interim. Um, one of the things that we realized is what we did was basically envision what an electronic wayfinding system should do for a building not for the second third floor so the, so we've talked to the larger exhibit and wayfinding subcommittee about taking these four kiosks and relocating them at the garden level in the extension and on the first floor because by the time you make your way up to the second floor a lot of this information would have been nice to know at an entry point to the building so we're working with them on that and then we will likely go to smaller kiosks for up in the second and third floor and further develop this information to provide more session specific uh, info that if you're on the second or third floor, you would like to see. And the idea behind these, you might remember the old bulletin boards that we used to have outside of each chamber and up in the gallery, these kiosks replace that. And for the most part, everything Jamie demoed to you provides that same information. We're looking at also how in the future we may be able to show when the chambers are in recess or when they're going to reconvene. Those types of things are things we would look at developing further on down the road. Is that okay? I can definitely remember the old bulletin boards, but one of the things we, we did have was we, we posted, for example, the bills to be considered for introduction and the, uh, the general file was always posted. It, that was the way it started out and then it was you know available online in different forms and the chambers were pretty strict about following those orders and i think they're less strict now and what will those kind of schedules be allowed to be permitted to or are we losing that and mr chairman thanks that's a great reminder of some other build outs we've discussed these qr codes serve two purposes one for people who don't want to touch the unit but also for more information than we can display mm -hmm. on the kiosks. And so one of the, that's one of the things Jamie has talked about is how you could take some of the information that's on the website and help people better direct them to where to find session specific information. Is there anything else? So that would be one way to achieve that, but that might be something as technology committee, if there's other things you would like to see developed as part of the legislative portion of of these kiosks we're certainly happy to um, take those suggestions and, and look at how we can build them out and mr chairman follow up a little bit you know i think we've gotten kind of spoiled but we assume that everyone accesses legislative information with a device somehow electronically and maybe that's a really good assumption because i think most people do but I think the citizens have a right to, to get this information when they're standing here trying to figure it out. And I, I, I think the discipline of it as well would be, um, I have all been concerned that we, we're not as rigorous as we used to be about the order of things like the introduction of bills or even the general file, and the, you know. And Mr. Chairman, um, I neglected to add, we do still have all of our hard copy daily calendars, purple sheets, all of that information. And so it would probably be a process discussion about how the how the bodies choose to, to follow or not follow those calendars. But we do provide all the, the hard copies as well in the 
uh, galleries and, and outside of the chambers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, sorry. Yeah, and I think there's a good question there. Are, are those still the useful type of information and in the format that they used to be? Um, we all used to gather the purple sheet and the green sheet and, and keep them and, you know, that was your Bible for the day. Now I think they're handed out and they hit the trash can probably immediately for most people. But there's some use somewhere. We ought to try to figure that out, especially for people that don't have electronic access. And I'm, I'm not sure their relevance, how connected they are to what we do as much as they used to be. I'm sorry to be kind of funky about this. Thoughts on that, Ms. Madsen? So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll transition into the larger exhibit and wayfinding project. And Ashley has some slides, but they were all uh, provided in advance, so I may just uh, visit with you about it. Um, that project um, was conceived in the 2021 session, and there was an appropriation with it and a statutory subcommittee of the State Building Commission and um, the legislature. It has six members on it, three members of SBC and three legislators. Uh, that group met during 2021 to select an exhibit designer. Um, they also did extensive work to develop a ROM cost budget for the 2022 session. That budget was kind of if you could do <clears throat> if you could do everything on this entire Capitol Square, the Capitol, the extension, the grounds, and the Herschler buildings, what would you do? And um, they were able to uh, get appropriations for the project that total about 5.5 million with uh, including the 2021 appropriation that they already had. They are in the process this interim. They have spent time doing what um, we call the, the look and feel of the exhibits and the wayfinding and trying to um, make sure that, that whatever is put in this building does not detract from the building is one of their number one goals. Um, secondly, they're working right now on budget reconciliation to take what their original um, goals were for the project and, and reconcile them with the monies available. Um, the timeline for that project is they will finish up conceptual design by the end of this year. And then um, in 2023, they'll work with the exhibit designer to go into what's called design development and then engineering drawings and fabrication will occur midway through 2023 and installation in 2024. Um, we're looking at whether or not any of the wayfinding package can be sped up and expedited from that. Um, we have a, originally the subcommittee had a goal that nothing would be affixed to the walls, but signage, um, we already have signage affixed to the walls. So they've kind of changed their, changed their thought process there. And, and that package is simpler than the exhibit package. And when you think of wayfinding, um, I often get the question of, well, didn't the building include signage as part of the whole Capitol Square project? And it did, but it only included code required signage. So it has Braille and it has the room number, but it doesn't tell you when you walk into the rotunda where room 110 and, and 113 are. The electronic wayfinding kiosks will help with that, but what actual physical wayfinding signage does for you is leave little breadcrumbs. And I love using the examples of hotels because I think that's the easiest way to envision what wayfinding is, is you go down a hall in a hotel and it'll tell you, you know, rooms 101 through 121 this way, rooms 113. So it does that kind of thing and it leads you through the building. One of the number one complaints of visitors in this building is it's beautiful and it's um, functional in a room like this seats a lot of people, but it's very difficult to find your way both in this building as well as getting down to the extension. It's difficult if you approach from the Herschler side. So the wayfinding package of this project is um, going to be from the time you step on site. If you, if you have mobility issues through the ADA, how do you find the ramps? If you're going to the extension, we'll want different direct, uh, directions on the exterior so you don't walk all the way up to the first floor and have to walk all the way down to the garden level. So that's the wayfinding portion of the project. The exhibit portion of the project is more to appeal to visitors who, if they're walking around by themselves on a self-guided tour, tell them, 
be able to know what they're looking at for families who come in for tourists coming from around the country to tell the story of this building its architecture and most importantly for students the big emphasis of the subcommittee is how do you make this building come alive for students and let them know that um, you know they have a role in the process and for adults how they can be engaged in the process so the other big portion of the, the exhibit project is on civic education and Rihanna is uh, co staffing that committee with me and she heads up our visitor services program and. Um, as both chairman may remember, we used to have a really robust legislators back to school program of which you both participated in and did Senator Simons do some of those as well and you know that was just a really engaging way. Um, to, to teach students about the process so the exhibit designer is using a lot of those old materials there's a visitor Center down in the extension. That is the area that's envisioned to be kind of the civic education portion and may have higher tech exhibits. The subcommittee um, has gone back and forth with both budget as well as maintenance over time and use in the capital proper. You, that's probably not the place you want the, as I call it, the Las Vegas effect. You don't want a lot of whiz bang things going on in the capital, but the visitor center is appropriate for that. In the capital itself, exhibits are envisioned primarily in a fixed location in the garden level because that's an area we can drive public traffic without it interfering with the business of the executive and legislative branch also a little bit more up on the third floor first and second floor the vision is more movable wall panels that for example in the house and senate lobby during the interim they could be placed in the lobby because there's not a lot of traffic and then during session they could be placed outside of the lobby so they don't interfere with with traffic so those are kind of some of the concepts uh, that the committee's trying to, to grapple with as they finalize their design. And I think the only other thing that I'd uh, mention about it right now is that um, the subcommittee has certain goals that won't be part of the actual fabrication and installation of exhibits and wayfinding that um, we've actually deemed to be called collateral materials. So once exhibits and wayfinding are up, how do you how do you reach out to teachers? How do you make sure you have the right lesson plans? What is the flow through the building? Um, what website do they go to? Right now, you can find information about capital tours on three to four different websites through the state of Wyoming, and they show different hours of the building being open. Sometimes they're just there's not a one stop shop for folks to go to. Some of those materials, um, which would also include a new tour booklet, may include um, <clears throat> some of these QR code concepts that may not be funded as part of the original project would be a potential phase two. I might take any questions. Quick question, we talk about civic education. My guess is we're primarily looking at elementary school groups. I don't know if we still do fourth grade Wyoming history, but certainly when I'm in the capital, it's mostly elementary school traffic. Are we thinking about junior high or high school or college level educational, civic education stuff as well and trying to do the gamut there as you're nodding? If you could maybe, how that's progressing or how we're kind of differentiating between probably the mostly retired population I meet every week who wants to see all 50 state capitals and elementary groups there's something between there we're offering for that other demographic yes mr chairman and that's a great question one of the um early phases of this project in 2015 when the oversight group um, first envisioned the idea of exhibits is they hired an exhibit designer at the time and their specific request was to correlate um, Wyoming social studies standards from grades four through 12 with what could be done as part of exhibits. That work was carried forward with the new exhibit designer hired and they are working closely with Department of Education staff. They co-staff along with um, State Construction Department, Department of Administration and Information and State Parks and Cultural Resources, this exhibit wayfinding subcommittee. But um, Department of Ed's role is also to try to make sure that the content you may have one exhibit and they have something called skimmers browsers and gorgers and that one exhibit you don't know it as a lay person but it's appealing it can appeal to a, a, a younger reader and it can appeal to older people you can 
have ways that you can get content through bring your own device and get more information. So they kind of hit each of these exhibits with a variety of different goals. So it's not that this one exhibits for, um, you know, the, the tourists going through all 50 states. It's that they're trying to hit the goals of those different users. They also try to hit goals for people who are visual versus, um, you know, more readers. The interpretive center may have over in the visitor center may have some more specific grade level exhibits. Um, we haven't seen that developed yet, but yes, that is definitely the goal as well as adult civic education. You know, the civic education visitor center wouldn't just be open for students, but it would also be available for adult learners as well. And then with all this information during session, do we have any kind of, I hate to call it basic um, <coughs> presenting kind of guidelines? You know, we, I know we have these handouts that say when testifying in front of a legislative committee, you know, make sure your phone is off, always address the chairman. Are we going to have any type of signage or are we still anticipating maybe just some paper copies when people walk into meetings that they could pick up? Um, or is, could we do any kind of electronic education on the process and how you participate in the legislative process? For those guests who are here all day during session, it's probably a much different group. The people who are here kind of wandering throughout the year versus the people who are kind of half visiting but really here for a purpose during session. Mr. Chairman, that's a great question. We currently have kind of bifurcated what we would call the tour pub tour booklet for the, just the general public wanting to see the building from our citizens guide and Anthony Sarah's group um, develops that each year and that gives a lot of the real kind of nuts and bolts of, of how to testify. We have talked on the tablets that Jamie mentioned outside of each meeting room. This has not been developed yet, but we've wondered if it would make sense when you hit the additional information button. We've thought and we've talked to the um, wayfinding vendor we could also potentially have sliding screens that you know every X number of seconds would turn over and they'd say things like, please turn off your cell phones and please sign in and, and those types of things because we are still putting those out in paper copy and, and things do get a little, a little, quite a bit of information that we can probably do a better job of displaying on those tablets over time. Other questions? Not seeing any currently. All right. Um, does that cover all of the wayfinding and your presentation, Ms. Matson? Okay. Anyone else in the audience or online want to comment on on wayfinding or what we're doing over the next two years promoting civic education? Mr. Chairman, do we have any members of the public online at all? <coughs> okay. We're just preaching to the choir. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Garrett is here. He's the public. We have a report. Yes. If you're public, you can if you wish. Please. Sure. Use that microphone. Introduce yourself. Welcome. Uh, my name is Amy Giglovich, and I'm a reporter for the uh, radio stations in, Ch in Cheyenne and uh, now in Jackson, and hopefully Rollins and some other places that can people can't get here. Um, I've been here as long as some of you <laughs> covering the legislature. I think it's over 20 years. I have to say, this improvement of the building is fantastic. It really is. We, you can go to a committee meeting and you can feel comfortable and you can talk. And I have to say, and it's just beautiful. It is actually beautiful. And I was in a committee meeting last week down in the tunnel and I thought it was a tunnel. It's going to be dark. No, it's great. It's absolutely great. Um, it's great down there. Yeah. So I have to say the improvements for somebody who had to be here all the time, just like you, have been phenomenal. Um, also, when he's talking about how to find things, I was going to go ask her how to find something the other day, but I found it myself, so I didn't have to. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anything that you can do to help people get around, because I have seen people in here. I, I've seen people in here that are visiting, and they'll ask me a question. I'll say, oh, we'll just go down there, and go in there, and you can go sit in a committee if you want and listen to it. Really? I'm like, yeah, if you want to, yeah, you just sign in, walk in, sit down and listen. So, so yeah, anything that can help people get around because even I get lost now. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. It's the only time I'm ever going to, and <laughs> I'm going to testify. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klubich. Any other public comments? Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett, if you have some. We always welcome the public. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Richard Garrett, I'm a resident resident of Cheyenne and a member of the public. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you to Wendy, her team, the entire LSO, Jamie. Amazing stuff. This building is, uh, is something that will be protected and, uh, and I hope enjoyed for another 140 some odd years by future generations. Just let's keep it as a workplace, not just a museum though. You know, let's let's bring people in to to do the people's business on a regular and recurring basis. That's that's one guidepost I hope you will put on the on the road to your success. Oh, any questions? Questions, Mr. Garrett? Now that he's a Cheyenne resident and no longer from Lander, you can have. No <laughs> All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Let's move on to our two p.m. topic on technology. Welcome back, Mr. Shop. Floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first item under this section is the purchase of laptops for legislators. As you all are aware, uh, we, we have a four-year laptop replacement cycle, and that's coming up for this turnaround with the new 67th legislature that's coming on. Um, we've ordered 60 of the 90 or so laptops so far for the individuals that, um, for instance, in the Senate, they might not be up for re-election or they might not have a general election opponent. So we've tried to get some of those orders out of the way so we're not replacing 93 now with the three additional um, legislators in D November and December. Um, so we're in the process of that. We've already received the first order of Surface Pros and um, the Lenovo laptops are going to probably come in next week. They have shipped. Um, but with that being said, uh, with the policy, the current legislators have the opportunity or may choose to purchase their laptop to keep um, that they've used for the last several years. And by following the Management Council policy that set out um, that you guys worked on, I think this policy was updated maybe four years or so ago, um, that you had recommended to Management Council and Management Council adopted, is that each legislator has the opportunity to purchase their laptop based off of independent sources um, and to take the average of what you find out there. So I did some research and I, there's a memo out there in your guys' packet. Um, it's kind of funny. I. If I try to create, or not create, but like copy a link of what I found on the website. And yesterday I was looking at this with Joe, who works in the IT section with me. And for instance, on the Surface Pro 6, that back market link has already been updated to a different computer. So if you clicked on the link, it didn't match up with the pricing that I had previously provided. But it does give you insight on how say used market works on these laptops is the link that I had given you if you clicked on it it was a good condition laptop um, and apparently that one is already sold and if you clicked on the link now it actually goes to a laptop that's in excellent condition and that price changed from like $314 up to I think it was $402 when I looked at it yesterday that is an on the memo but for those Surface Pros, it kind of does fit in to the line of what it would cost to purchase a used laptop. And the average prices between Amazon and this back market site was $399. Um, there isn't a lot of things on there. The, the policy has us tried to find as um, a laptop in, with the similar specifications, all that. And obviously, if you're in the used market, you might see the same model laptop, but maybe it has more memory in it or something of that nature. So I did that and you can see what the average prices are. The reason why there are four laptops on here instead of two has to do with the election two years ago. 
So since if someone retired or they didn't return for this current term, they had the opportunity to buy their laptop two years ago. So some of the newer legislators from this term got a brand new one rather than the one that you received four years ago. So some of these laptops are two years old and the other laptops are four years old. So that's the difference in, in the pricing if you had a question about that. So I guess my question is more on the appropriation. So now that we're only doing it every four years, do we just have an, an extra line item in our budget and the legislative feed bill every four years for a one-time laptop purchase instead of structuring it every two years and doing 46 at a time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. We put a line item in the feed bill every four years. We did, this committee actually was involved with this probably say six years ago, we had changed it to two years. And then there were some budget cuts the executive branch took of, of like say 10 or 15%, I can't remember the number, but um, one of the choices that our office made at that time was not to replace the laptops on a two-year period ago, four-year period, and they cut that out, and we've stuck with that four-year period since then. Mr. Chairman, the, the four-year period has worked well, hasn't it? I mean, there's, there's no reason to go off of the four years. I think the two years, we thought, well, things are changing so fast. These laptops get hard to use. All, they won't really last four years and be effective, so let's do two years. The truth is they are working four years and are effective. Is that right? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, in, in my opinion, it has worked very well. I think at one time when I first started here, we might have even been on like a three-year cycle, which really threw things off because it's in the middle of someone's term. And then you're like swapping laptops out with and doesn't fall in line with the election cycle. And that's why we went with either two years or four years to have it fall in line with the election cycle. And it's a lot easier, um, even in the instance where, say, a legislator might retire and not run for re-election, if they don't want to purchase their laptop, we then reissue that laptop to the, the new incoming legislator in that district. Yeah, go ahead, Senator Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question, um, because when I first got into office, I did a Surface Pro and I didn't like it. And so we were on the two-year program then, and so then I could replace it in two years and not have to suffer for four years with it. I don't think it liked me either. And so I wondered if there's a way that if, if someone's not agreeing, say they try the Surface Pro and don't like it, is there a way for them to you know, not have to suffer for four years? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Steinmetz, we have worked individually with legislators on that issue. Um, some people do come to us and say, I would really like the mid-sized laptop rather than the Surface Pro. It's, it's, it's kind of hit and miss, if you will, but um, just by like communication with us, we find that somebody wants to switch, we will try to work with the legislators and swapping them, but it's totally based off of them coming to us and talking to us about that. And then the computers we, that legislators don't take back that are only four years old, what exactly is the disposal process then? I know some go to staff perhaps, do others just get sold on the open market or what's the plan? Historically, uh, Mr. Chairman, historically those laptops have, was issued to staff. Uh, we, we changed that process a, f a few years ago where rather than buying staff desktop computers, we bought them laptops with a docking station so they have their own computer to take to the committee meetings that they staff and um, when they leave Cheyenne. Um, and so that no longer works where we like issue them to staff to use for committee meetings, but we have still like issued those types of devices to session staff. So when, um, obviously you all are aware that we'll have staff for like a couple months every year and we don't replace those computers quite at the same speed as what we do for our full-time staff. 
And a lot of these computers that are returned to us are still in really good shape and can be used. So we'll give them to session staff to use. And if they're can't be used there, we use the um, through A&I administration information there, the Wyoming state surplus process. Sorry, Case. Um, Mr. Chairman, I mean, it sounds like everything we're doing is working really well and just keep doing the same thing is what sounds like we should do. I. I when you actually do this average of the laptop price to get the the, the sell price um i mean those prices change every day and that's pretty impractical you don't do it every time somebody wants to buy one i mean you just kind of gather up the comparable numbers and then just kind of pick a price and then stick with that for a while is that the way that works practically uh, mr chairman it, it, it the policy doesn't like really like let you lie on a, like a precise process for it. Yeah. Um, and you're absolutely 100% right. I mean, I just had an example that I have on this sheet that's not no longer even available. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's just at the research that we did at the time. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily comment on the process itself, but these are also retail prices as well. So. Um, right. But it's not an exact science, but we're just trying to follow the policy that was set. And Mr. Chairman, in the end, how does it actually work in practice? So you got the Joe legislator that wants to set, wants to buy his laptop. Um, you've got these research prices that may be old or not, but um, how does it? How do you complete the deal? Does does management council approve the lap the price, or is there is there anything to that? I'm not suggesting there should be. I'm just trying to find out how it actually happens when the rubber hits the road. Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, historically, this committee has set that price. That's what I thought. And it doesn't even go to the management council level. And probably next month, when after the general election, I'll send out an email to all legislators letting them know that this will be the price and they can contact us. I, I might also add this. I, I failed to mention this earlier is when a legislator does choose to purchase their laptop, that money goes into the laptop fund that LSO has. So when we actually ask for like, say a line item in the feed bill for you to buy laptops, depending on how much money's in that fund, we might not ask for the same amount every single two years, depending on how many people purchase their laptop. So this money is reused for new purchases, if you will, as well. So, Mr. Chairman, yep. it, it seems that that works pretty well, and it seems that this committee could work with Jamie and um, in a month or so when you get ready to actually start doing this and making plans, um, you just come up with your recommended prices, submit it to the committee, we approve them um, via email, and then you go forth, if that's all right. If that works for everybody else, that'd be an easy way to do this. Senator Case, is that just because we think the value will depreciate over the next three months, and so it's unfair to ask to pay the, the recommended price on the memo? I'm, it, I'm okay to go from with the memo, Mr. Chairman. I'm okay to set the price now if you want, but it seems like they probably should be a little bit more generic, and he already said one jumped around already, and, you know, could, if you want to say this is our, my recommended prices right now, I'm, I'm happy to approve it, but if you want more time to think about it and actually hone in on some recommended prices, I'm okay with that too. So it doesn't matter to me. Maybe a more broad question for Mr. Obrecht or, uh, or Jamie. Is there any prohibition um, in, let's say we just gave every legislator who'd served four years their laptop as a, a parting gift. Is there anything against that in our rules or in tax policy that you know of? Do other states do that? I know we've had this program for about eight years now about being able to buy back, but is, is there a, besides the, well, $40,000? Uh, besides Article 16, Section 6. That's where I'm getting to. Is it, a, is it some no, is it a gift or is some type of um, prohibition on allowing a legislator to leave with a laptop issued to them? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not really sure about the answer of that. Um, I, I do know that this committee has explored other th 
things in the past about maybe even possibly giving X amount of money for a legislator to purchase a laptop or whatever and doing that type of appropriation. It never went yeah. anywhere. There's also a lot of legislators that want us to buy, say, Apple products compared to what we are doing. Um, and when we went through the bid process on that, we never went down that route just because the expense was way more expensive. Um, and we technically are a window shop here and that's what our IT staff is. Um, so we've never gone that route, but I, I really don't know your answer about a parting gift type thing though, Mr. Chairman. So, I mean, from the economics point of view or the efficiency, if the laptops are still useful to the legislature and a person's not gonna be a legislator anymore and it can be handed to a new legislator, um, that seems like the thing to do unless they wanna, and I can understand why they'd wanna keep their laptop. It's useful to them and they've got other stuff on it. Um, but if they're, and, and they're willing to pay the going price sort of roughly calculated, I'm okay with that too. But I don't think we should go down the road of giving legislators when they leave their laptop. I do know one year I may have nicely asked, how do I put this nicely? There are some legislators who heavily use their laptops and as you're well aware, there are some legislators, at least previously to the last couple of years, before we had Zoom and had some of those functions we needed during COVID, I mean, they hardly check their email, they use their laptops one day a week and then put it away for the rest of the year where I know many of us, I probably use my legislative laptop every, if not every other day, every third day. Um, and so after four years, my previous laptop got a lot more use than say some others. Um, and I think I nicely asked to have somebody else's laptop besides mine if they're all the same price. Everybody wants Charlie Scott's laptop. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, there, is that still a practice? I mean, I'm sure you see some come in in more excellent condition and some come in in poor condition after four years, but has there been anybody um, I don't know, grumble or say, um, hey, this is an excellent condition, the price should be different than this one that's been used and abused a bit more? You know, all these laptops, obviously the condition varies on the use. Um, there's always questions about like, say, hey, can I buy Senator Scott's laptop It's still my own, that type of thing. But, um, you know, it's, it's their laptop and I guess this is just the price with the policy that we set, you know. Chairman, it sort of seems to me that the LSO uh, and Jamie's staff kind of, they want to keep the laptops in good a condition and the fleet of laptops in the legislature and staff. And so probably the ones you want to get rid of are the least good ones, the ones, um, and that's okay. And so if, uh, say, an unused laptop comes into the fleet, you might work it into another legislator and, you know, use your judgment about which ones are disposed and things like that. I don't think we have to get too overly prescriptive on this yeah mr chairman if i just might add um, basically what senator case said is absolutely true on the folks that do return their laptops the ones that are in really good conditions are the ones that we reissue for like session staff the ones that aren't in the greatest condition are probably the ones that go to surplus further questions comments from the committee Perhaps my only concern about approving this price today is I would imagine by January 1st or whenever you ask for legislators not coming back to turn them in by, what is that usually December 1st, December 15th, the price may go down five, 10% when it comes to technology. Any thoughts on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I can take a look at research um, again on these prices but I will actually uh, send out an email after the general election in November at these prices. It won't be in January. It's, it's one month away is when everybody will get notified of the price. No, the price on this list. Well, I, I'm wondering if you're gonna send out another memo after the general election, is that right? Uh, the, Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, the plan right now is um, to send an email out to all legislators after the general election. With a price. With a price. And so it's a matter of if you set the price today or if you want me to 
update this list and do an email ballot or something in the first of November, uh, whatever you would like me to do. Mr. Chairman, I'm in, I'm indifferent, but if you think they're, if you think it's worth doing, I would certainly yield to you and we could approve them by email. But 25%. yeah, but I'm not sure if we should, I'm not sure if we should approve these exact prices, just approve a range within here. You know, is it really going to be 391 81 a nice whole number would probably be like 350 right? and you know let's round it down to the nearest fifty dollars sure i just that think some motion yeah that's easier so it would be three 350 350 four, uh, 550 and 750 on your list second seconded by steinmetz any other discussion on that motion? Senator Cost, sounds okay. All right, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 I'll say no. That motion's passed. You can communicate that. Go ahead. If I just want to make sure I wrote the right numbers down. So it'd be 350, 350, 550, and $700? 750. 750, thank you. Um, next up, new voting system, unless there's any other public comment on computers or chief clerks, you're okay having session staff use previous legislators computers and working well. Okay. All right, new voting system. Go ahead, Jamie. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to give you all an update on where we're at on the voting system. I know this comes up every session with electronic voting. And um, ideas about, you know, you say transparency or whatever. Um, but a as you all are aware, Wyoming has had an electronic voting system for quite a while. Um, I, I guess there's sometimes there's maybe semantics about what people expect out of electronic voting, that sort of thing. The way I look at it is we have an electronic voting system with a oral roll call tradition. So the chief clerk will go through the roll call and it'll, it'll be a voice vote for each legislator to say aye or whatever. And the chief clerk then records it electronically rather than the legislator at their desk. And we've had this system since before I started here. I, I think it was built in like 2000 or something like that. It might have been a Y2K project. I am not totally sure about when it like started, but it is a very old system and outdated system. So for the last couple of years, we've been trying to update that system. And this system isn't for legislators to vote from their desk. It's basically keeping the same tradition that's there where the chief clerk would call the roll and they will indicate your vote just like they always historically have done. Um, it's, it's a system that is current on technology. Last session, we basically ran this system in parallel with the current roll call system for testing purposes and did ran this system in both the House and the Senate, Senate throughout the entire process and probably processed not, I'm not going to say we did a hundred percent of all the votes or whatever, but probably 75 to 80 percent at least and found a few th comments that not that the system didn't work properly or anything like that but some improvements to the to the process to make the easier on the chief clerks and we're working through those changes in the system right now and our plan right now is for the chief clerks to start using this new system in january any comment from either chief clerk on it's going okay and you feel like you'll be ready and learning the system completely okay is there any kind of i guess maybe the overall question for the legislature is there different functionalities or anything that we um, either legislators personally or the public will notice as part of the new system that they're not uh, privy to or they don't have access to now uh, mr chairman this system is basically designed 
off the same principles and rules as the old system. So from the public standpoint or the legislator standpoint, unless we told you we were changing it, you wouldn't even notice it. The votes will still go out to the website and all that, Every everything else is set up. So without us even mentioning this, you might not notice it unless there's a hiccup with the system and then you, then you might notice it. Because obviously the other one has been stable and been used for many, many years. Um, but our hope is that the, nobody will even notice that this has been introduced. Hi, Senate Chief Clerk, any comments or thoughts? Welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I did have, I had a few comments prepared for the Chief Clerk report, but I'd be happy to give you those now uh, with regards to the new uh, voting system. It's basically an application that will sit on our laptops and is part of the LMS system. So from our standpoint, there's much less data entry and less chance of error um, as opposed to the system we're using today, where we're actually replicating everything out of LMS to put into the other system. This being um, integral to LMS, it will it'll make our jobs a little bit easier. Uh, eventually, uh, I think Jamie can give us more information, but future enhancements might even minimize some of the work done in the corner of the chamber by the computer clerk in making votes available to the public on the website. So that, that, that is a possibility with this system um, once we get used to it and, and it could possibly be enhanced. Um, the other thing I might mention is because it is an application on our laptop, it would be possible to just sit at the desk and take roll, as opposed to moving to that standalone machine to take roll. It's somewhat of a tradition that the chief clerk stands to take roll, so that might be something we might want to consider um, as to whether or not we would attempt to do that. Um, repetition of the votes, we still plan to do that on the Senate side. Um, and I've mentioned that uh, to legal, that may be something that we now memorialize in the rules um, since we've been doing it now, oh gosh, since the years at Jonah. So about seven years, I think, total. Um, that Those are pretty much my comments on the new roll call system. We uh, did do those enhancements after the last session with the help of um, Jamie and Beth, who were actually doing the testing during the last session. We got those back from the programmer, and we've just looked at it again for the first time this week on Monday. So we're a little frantic to get into it and really uh, run it through the paces. But I think there's ample time to do that between now and, and the beginning of session. Mr. Chairman, um, so first off, I'd like to say kudos to staff for, for building this system and getting it implemented and to um, our chief clerks and according staff, every, everybody to, to do this in-house. It was just stunning when you said you were going to do this, I thought, and took it on and did it. So I guess we're going to find out for sure, but it, it's really successful. And I, and I do love the way it pre preserves some of our traditions. Um, you know, just things like the tradition of standing to call the roll. I think that helps to focus the chamber on that a vote is happening. And I think it gets people's head in the game a little better than sometimes, uh, you know, you don't have that visual cue, uh, you know, I'm sure we get used to it, but whatever. And then it's kind of amazing that that tradition that started in Jonah about the readback kind of continued. That was that's actually been a pretty good thing for the Senate. I'm not sure what the, how the House does that, but um, I don't blame you. <laughs> but actually, it's been a good thing in the Senate. I think we really like it. So um, I'm sure this is going to go really well. Where where the next step for this? Where there's an automatic uh, go to the 
the corner table and then out to the world. Um, do we have any idea when we might be able to do that? Because that would really bring it home. Um, Mr. Chairman, we actually looked at that for it to be automatic with this process. The, one of the limitations we have is the workflow that we have through the legislative management system from going from, say, general file to second reading and third reading. And I, I appreciate um, Chief Clerk, um, Senate Chief Clerk Ellen, to like point out something I didn't say is that when this vote occurs, the action is now passed directly to the system. Previously, the computer clerk would look at a piece of paper and then put it in of like the vote ID and that would pull in the vote. Right now, the action is there. You, you potentially could have a human error, manual error of a vote that actually was passed, but they could indicate that it failed, you know, just because it was like a, a person was doing that and that's what feeds the bill digest everything so basically the way the system's set up now as soon as the chief clerk closes the vote that action of passing or failing then goes to our um, legislative management system and the only limitation that we have of it going immediately out to the website is the workflow task needs to be completed so those actions are there where they don't have to input that, but they just have to complete the task to then send it on to like say second reading or third reading. Just follow up a little bit. What would it take to do that last step? Um, and you know, I, Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, I'm not really sure because with the consultant that we've had that's done the development on that system, He's pretty much told me that he he can't do that, but we have tried to do that. I, I'm not saying that there's maybe not an answer, okay. but so far, the way we were looking at this project is before we have add like whistles and bells and some enhancements to the system, let's create a new voting system that has the same features as before where we're not going back and let's get that in place and be comfortable with it and then like look at maybe possible enhancements yeah i miss chairman i think that's fair enough but i think we should keep this as a goal uh, i mean it really closes the loop on being truly electronic and truly real time and just you know the only difference is is it's not a screen on the wall so i hope we'll continue to go after it thank you Any other common new system upcoming? Okay. Demo of new legislator portal. So, um, Mr. Chairman, what, what I'm going to demo for you isn't necessarily the new legislator portal because it's just being finalized right now. It's going to be ready for the legislators that started in November. But I'm going to back up and talk about what brought us to this point of doing this portal is over the last couple of years, we've had a recruitment and retention committee within our office talking about staff and training and what we need to do for employees. And one of the things that we were looking at is making sure that the, for our new employees that come on board, that they get consistent information um, from depending on no matter what section you're like starting in, if it's budget fiscal, if it's legal or whatever, um, the same documents apply. And historically, if you don't have a place um, for folks to access this type of stuff, it's kind of dependent on their supervisor or whatever, what information they share. And maybe they've worked here for a little while and they're like, oh, I didn't know about that because something just might be missed. So we looked at doing this this summer of a way for our new employees that are coming into LSO of making sure that they have access to everything that they need. And that's what I'm gonna demo for you. But basically after we did that, we thought about it some more and said, well, you know, this is actually a really good idea to do the same concept, but for new legislators. And so when obviously with the election coming up in November, we thought it was a perfect opportunity to to kind of replicate what we did for our own internal employees for new legislators. So when 
I think we're gonna have like 30 potentially new legislators in November. So when we do the new legislator training, um, we'll still go through all the other steps, but we have a site for them to be able to access and they can access the documents to get set up on payroll, the documents to get to the JAC SharePoint site, um, all these different links or whatever. So that, that's really what the concept is. So what I'm gonna demo for you is what we set up internally for our employees, but just take that idea and we're basically doing the same thing for new legislators. It just hasn't been finalized yet, but it will be ready when the new legislators um, start their training next month. Do you have any questions on that before I start the demo or just show you what it is? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wondered if it maybe old legislators might need <laughs> training on it too. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. The site name when I first created this, I called it the New Legislator Portal, and um, we actually renamed that. And I, I can't remember what the name is, but we took that off there because you'll you'll find that this site actually has ask, access to links that all legislators will be able to use and find useful, in my opinion. Just a second, I'm gonna share my screen. So, um, so th this is like the screen that we set up for our new employees. And I'll just add this piece of information as well is at that NALIT conference for N NCSL IT staff that I went to a couple weeks ago, Ryan Frost, who is, um, on our staff and works in the Anthony's group. He's the one who did all the content on this. And him and I presented this at Nail It to all the different IT staffs around the state. And it was a, basically it was a showcase type thing where there was like seven or eight different states that had an application that they wanted to show to other folks. And you did a presentation up front and kind of gave an overview of what you wanted to demo. And then it was like in a hotel or whatever banquet room where you could go around to the different tables and like see what the application was. When Ryan did this, I, I wish I'd like had a picture of this, but there was probably like four or five people deep around this table that we were at of him like demoing it. And I think in the two hour time of us demoing it, I think he went through the demo like five times for different states. So um, a bunch of different states really liked the idea that we came up with and wanted to replicate that for their states. So on this site here, it's just like a welcome screen. Um, you know, who we are, what our leadership is. Um, the same type of concepts will happen for the legislators as well. Um, you have your like get started feature here. Um, welcome to Welcome to your next adventure. You, you know, you have questions and need additional help. And this is for the new employees of us getting them on board with a checklist for them to take a look at. And um, like their first week or so on the job, they can take a look at this different type of things. When you go to like meet your team, we have like an our story about the legislative service office, about how it was created and the history behind it. Um, the page of the leadership within the legislative service office, um, Matt is the director, and then a list of the managers or administrators within our office. Um, we also have like the different teams, you know, as you're a new employee with pictures of faces in different sections that you might not meet away, you have like a kind of an organizational chart of the different sections within LSO. And these pages, I believe, are replicated on the, on the legislator portal as well, so everybody can know the staff and what sections they're in. Um, this resources section is probably the section that will be most helpful to new employees, but also will be set up for legislators of any links and accesses to different access to different um, sites, um, information, whatever. We've tried to include it on here. We did have some training videos for staff as well. Um, there's some like training videos on the new legislator portal about Outlook or how to use Microsoft Teams, um, stuff that Microsoft has put out. 
You also have like information about the capital. You know, if you're down here in session and maybe someone from your district comes comes down here and visits you, there's some information here that you can learn about the capital and maybe do a tour or that type of thing and be able to explain some stuff. So I, I just wanted to kind of go over this concept with you and say this is what we're doing for our office and this will be available for the new legislators that start um, or going to be starting in January, but are going to start training next month after the election. And are we sending that to the entire legislature then for them to, I, I guess my question is how much are we advertising this to the other legislators that aren't um, freshmen or onboarding? We will have a, an email sent out to make sure everyone's aware that there is a page, because I think this is useful across the board with the information in a much maybe easier format than me going on the whyalleg.gov site. And I know where a lot of that is, but it, this looks a lot more user friendly to find that information quickly internally. Are we going to be sending, I guess I would ask that we send um, an email out to all members, along with the new members, to at least let them know we have such a thing internally that they could quickly find SharePoints for JAC and some of that internal information that you know we forget how to find at times. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my, my understanding is that as soon as the election's over, Anthony's group, you know, contacts them right away and they'll send out an email to them with a link. My expectation is, though, is there's probably going to be communication with the entire body for other legislators to access the link to. I, I haven't been part of those conversations, but I don't believe this sharing of this site will just be limited to new legislators. Um, legislators that are going to be returning will also be able to see the site as well. We all have SharePoint now, but I think it is good to have a better kind of matrix internal legislator page to define stuff, share information, and kind of make sure the internal mechanics and trying to find the rules manual or the manual of legislative procedure to the chairman's handbook. Um, an easier way to find all that from an internal site does seem agreeable. So thank you for developing. Mm -hmm. anything Mr. Else? Chairman, all, all those items that you listed all have a link on one page within the site. Questions committee or any areas you want Ms. Jamie to walk through with us? The analytics, is that anything interesting? Because I'm looking on your screen of all the, the fun stuff up there. Uh, there. There's nothing to share on that. that okay. Just my access to the site. Got it. Um, all right, seeing any other questions, any other public comment? Mr. Garrett, come on down. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, again, Richard Garrett. I am a uh, board member of the Wyoming Capital Club, and uh, it's our privilege, uh, and I, sp I think I speak for all lobbyists, to um, work in this building and work with, um, uh, what do we have now, 93 people that are uh, so dedicated to our state and to the LSO as well. So I don't want to outrun my headlights on this, but. Um, I will volunteer that we will try to assist the LSO if it seems appropriate to, um, for example, provide links to um, the um, Wyoming Capital Club's directory. And uh, in that way, legislators, both incoming and uh, veteran, can um, access uh, that kind of information that's, that's associated with individual lobbyists and even the capital club in general that could serve to assist their processes on behalf of their constituents. So I just throw that out there as volunteering to see if it's appropriate. And I thank you for your consideration on that. Go ahead, Senator Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and um, not a this is just a comment, not for Richard necessarily, but just a comment too that um, he kind of sparked a thought in my mind that it would be nice to have, for example, Dick in our Sergeant at Arms phone number 
to unlock the kitchen for us when we're at, you know, the highway patrol has locked it and or on the weekend we're locked out of the kitchen or things like that of, you know, that might be other useful information as well as the lobbyists. I think that's a great idea. We could access that without our little book and be able to call people on the weekend when we need to. So thanks for bringing that up. That's a great idea. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, committee. Thank you. Um, and did that cover digital training for legislators as well, Jamie, or is that another topic you want to delve into? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that topic was on the agenda. Um, Senator Steinmetz had asked for that to be on there. I, I'm not, her and I had had a conversation about some stuff. Previously, we've tried to offer some different trainings for legislators, like with Microsoft Teams and so forth, and it typically hasn't been um, a lot of people attend these trainings or whatever. So I, I kind of had, had put this on the agenda at her request, so I'm not sure she might have more information on this. Sure, go ahead, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I was kind of hoping, Jamie, you would just include the Zoom training a little bit in your new legislator training because it has become quite a part of our life um, as we've, you know, we talked earlier, the LSO has taken a lot of new responsibilities on, and so have we as legislators, as the digital world has invaded our lives quite um, in a new way in many areas. So, so that was just something that I felt, and then it kind of goes together with the streamlining work and email management, and that is trying to get some kind of a uniform process for all of us. For example, um, when you go on to uh, the Appropriations Committee, Don sends out a link um, and it goes right into your calendar when you have a meeting and then it contains all of your committee notebook and everything as well, which links to your SharePoint. Now I realize other committees after a discussion with Jamie, we don't host our, our materials on the SharePoint site, so, so we can't maybe link to that. But it, it's so um, handy that if you are on your phone and you need to zoom in, you can just hit that link right off of your calendar. Um, also, to, if, if our calendars were loaded with the, um, the meeting site and maybe even the hotel site that the legislature selected and you're coming into a town, you can hit that and, and if your phone links up to it, you could maybe even get directions to that when you're coming into town. But those were just some of the thoughts I had and what those two, um, two bullet points were from my perspective, just to kind of streamline it so that, and so that our, um, when someone sends a link or a committee meeting or whatever they're sending from LSO, um, it comes in a uniform way. For example, we had the Joint Appropriations and Joint Education Committee meeting the other day and we were sent a link as a panelist. Consistently, that link is going into my clutter. And I've heard the same thing from other legislators as well. And so, whereas in another committee meeting that's going into my calendar, it's easy to access and I can get to it. The other one I'm panicking because I don't have an email and it's, it maybe it's how my settings are set up on my email, but I know Senator Hicks is having the same kind of issues. And then I've heard the same um, issues from some of our general public, which is they're having trouble connecting as a panelist. and. Um, I've had some that can't get on as a panelist, which I had, I missed part of the select water committee meeting the other day because for two days I had trouble getting on as a panelist. So I know there's a, some problems there and it could be me, but then I've heard from constituents that they can't get on. And then my husband, when he testified with corporations the other day, he said he was able to get on once to testify, but he had points on another topic and he couldn't get back in. Once he was a panelist, he was prohibited from coming back in as a panelist again. So those those two, that's what I was thinking of. That's Katie Talbot's fault. I don't think it's anyone's <laughs> fault, Mr. Mr. Co-Chairman. I think it's just technology yeah. and us working through how we do it. You know, it's all new kind of. 
and Zoom does have a function where when you remove a panelist, you can't let them back in. You can put them, if you put them back in the waiting room, um, but I've been, as a chairman before, had that problem where I've just removed them from the room after they were done speaking, but apparently they're not allowed back into that Zoom meeting when you remove them um, for the entirety of the day. So I hope LSO has that same understanding of the capabilities of Zoom. I do think we did have a, uh, an appropriations kind of overview from our budget and fiscal director, what, last Thursday at 7 a.m.? Um, and I wasn't able to attend, but I did think that was a great idea for just information for new legislators and um, current legislators to just kind of have that continuing every month, having one or two things for here's things you should know that other committees are doing or what the budget looks like um, in a more interactive setting. I thought that was great. Um, when we set that up. Hi, welcome. You heard Hello, about Karen Vaughn Ellis. I'm one of the LEs that uh, typically runs those meetings. Um, I only caught a portion of what was said as I was on my way down here when you were speaking about emails. Um, it is. It has been a learning process, I guess, for all of us. Um, one of the things that um, we don't have consistency on and we're, we're working towards is the way that I send, for example, emails to the Joint Appropriations Committee or the Senate Appropriations Committee, having meeting notices in there embedded, having the links embedded so that everything is there. Um, one of the things I do because I do, I'm heavily involved with teaching session staff about the Zoom. Um, I heard you mention, Mr. Chairman, about removing someone. Um, I embolden that and put it in red and make every notation that I can that says do not remove someone um, because it's a one-way trip. Um, I know that because I was the first one at LSO to ever remove someone. Yeah. Um, not knowing that that's what that would do. Um, but we were very fortunate and it was right before lunch and we found work around so that we could get somebody back in to testify. Um, but I do understand that that is an issue um, with the RI panelist. Um, and they, because we don't typically hang up on anyone, what we'll do is we'll promote you to a panelist and when it appears the committee is finished, we will go ahead and remove you and put you back as an attendee. If they hang up or disconnect before we have the opportunity to move them back, we don't have a way to get them back into that role. And so that's kind of what happens that makes it so that they can't get back in. Um, if they'll just give us a moment to get their permissions sorted out, um, then we can go ahead and do that. Um, but some think as soon as they're done, they, they just, they need to jump off right away. And that, that can create a problem. And unfortunately, I don't know that we have a technology solution for that other than to just ask them if they, you know, to be patient so that we can get their, their technology set up appropriately. Um, was there other, any other questions? So, let me, it might be a, top, a question for Mr. Obrecht. So, because I know management council struggled with this too on when people can sign up to be a, an official participant and testify, and we've gone back <laughs> and forth on that. and I. Well, I could say what I believe is the current state and be corrected, or I guess I could ask Mr. Obrecht what the most recent iteration is, but I believe it's five o'clock the day before the meeting um, that if someone decides to testify, they are sent the panelist link, um, but if they do not meet that cutoff, they're not sent the panelist link and they are not allowed to really have it unless the chairman has has LSO. I've had the frantic calls at 9 a.m. during my committee meeting I have to testify, you have to send me the link and then you have to clear it. Is that, can you just walk through the process of where we are now when it comes to um, testifying? Mr. Chairman, thank you. There's a couple um, of links. There is the link that we put on the website, which takes you to a registration page where you have to input your information and give us the topic that you're testifying. That does close 5, 5 p.m. on the day before, uh, unless the chairman approves otherwise. The panelist link is the link that goes specifically to committee members and staff members that we know will be attending online. That avoids that registration process and pops you directly into the room with your name and everything already appearing. 
<clears throat> it is supposed to. Um, if it doesn't, um, then I've done something wrong because that's the way it should work. Um, but yes, if they do not meet the 5 p.m. deadline the day before, um, then they do need, if they do notify staff, staff will clear it with the chairman before we give them that testify link that we typically have on the website. And then there has been, I think, an issue released on the, one of the committees I'm on, where if you are a remote panelist legislator and someone asks you for the link, you just copy and send that link right to them. And that's really not the link we want the general public who's testifying to have because it throws them right into um, the meeting with full access. Absolutely. And I'm not sure I... if we've nicely told legislators, don't do that. Have we communicated that, uh, not send the panelist link, let LSO send a separate link? We, we um, I know personally, I send an email that says, please do not share your link. Um, I did have a committee meeting recently where I had three people with the same name that were all panelists. Um, and I was asked to rename the ones that were not the original person. And unfortunately, from my tech perspective, I can't tell who's who until they turn on their camera and speak and I recognize that they are not Director Obrick, that they are not Senator Steinitz um, or whoever's name they appear. But yes, that is a problem um, if a legislator or a panelist does share their specific link, um, that other person pops in with the same name. Then Director Obrecht, where are we kind of on the process? Five o'clock cutoff, but in, there have been times where a legislator then, any legislator or the chairman of the committee can ask LSO to send um, a link letting someone in, or is there, is there a formal process on this or we're just kind of all over the map on, because there are some people that are very strict, some chairman on if they don't ask by five o'clock and others say, hey, if you want the link, I'll have LSO send all five of you and you can all jump in the conversation. Is that where we are, just kind of chairman prerogative or where does management council want us to be? Mr. Chairman, it is chairman prerogative, um, but if LSO staff are notified after the cutoff, we'll always send that on to the chairman for their approval. And then it's up to the chairman whether they decide to grant it or not. Yeah, well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm, we're not quite there yet on this. We've come so far when we first had to put in the Zoom meetings on the emergency basis. And, and then, I mean, this is light years ahead of that. But my goal is to have the online presence be the same as the presence in the room. So that if uh, Mr. Garrett there, we're going through the agenda, he's it's very clear he wants to testify on agenda item one. Um, but then we get to talking in the weeds on agenda item three, and it's something that he wants to address the committee on, mm -hmm. and he's in presence. We've, we've always thought that that was the way we inform each other and move forward. And so the online is a little clunkier to do that. Um, it's sort of like, now I, I signed up for the first part, it's, it's done and gone. And I think this is kind of what happened to your husband. Um, and then it's relevant there, they want to participate. And there's sort of an inside track and, an, and, an, and a non-existent track. The inside track is that if you send a quick email to the committee chairman or another member of the committee, or maybe you have the staff member's email, or maybe it comes in over your phone, you get you get noticed and I'll say to the staff person, hey, I know that so-and-so wants to testify again. Can you let them in? And it, and it happens and it's marvelous. But a lot of people in the public don't have that way to communicate to this. So what are they left to do? Call the LSO main office? On, I, I mean, so I don't know how we fix this. Um, and you know, the other thing is that general public comment. Not everybody wants to make general public comment, but maybe they do by the time you get to general public comment and you have the same problem on, on that issue. So, uh, and, and I don't know how we fix all this. I just know that we've come a long way. But to the members of the public, it's still better to be, be there in person if you really want to track a meeting. It, that There's no getting around that. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Simons? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think my thought was just to try to get us a little farther down the road, which is some consistency in how everything yeah. is done. And I have to laud Karen because she's like our Zoom guru. She's the one that got yeah. me into the Select Water Committee meeting when I couldn't get in. And I had the actual panelist link where we had to um, answer all the questions and we were frantically answering questions and trying to get in and trying to get in. <laughs> and so um, we have come a long way and I'm thankful that I didn't have to drive to Afton, you know, because it was, it, I would have just had to be excused. And so we have come a long way and I give kudos to all of our staff that has had to adjust to this because I know it's been a, a heavy lift. So, but if we could just get a little further down the road and now that we're past emergency and get consistency and um, how those, you know, how our committee meetings are delivered and maybe we, everybody wants them in their calendar and I think it's a great help to have them there if they do load into your calendar. Um, and just, just a little more consistency in what we're doing. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make one more kind of, there, there is another possibility. During meetings, you could have a contact information available during the meeting that's on the screen, or it's a place to click, where if you want to click on that, it sends a message to maybe the chairman that you, that you would like to testify. That would be the same as raising your hand in the audience. Now, I understand committees have different rules. Um, I mean, that would be the same as Mr. Garrett raising his hand over there in the corner. But as a committee chairman, we may not be taking committee testimony right now. So, yeah, I mean, it may not be appropriate. But if there was that contact in a way that you communicated that you would like to make a comment, like to be admitted, or however that works, I mean, theoretically, that could go a long ways here. Might mean more work for the chairman, or maybe they pawn it off the staff, or I'm, I'm not quite sure, but do you see what I'm trying to say? Does it make sense? That's all I'm saying. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Case, I, I, I guess I need to explain the difference between interim and session. So if, if, you, if, this, if a meeting's happening during a session and you're debating three bills or whatever for House Judiciary or whatever committee, that testify link is up throughout that entire meeting. Anybody could jump in at any time. However, in the interim, there's the policy of signing up 5 p.m. the day before. So we have like that testify link coming down prior to the meeting, but during session, exactly what you did explain, somebody could actually click on the testify and get jump on the meeting as the meeting's going. So there is a little bit of difference between session meetings and interim meetings. Do we have anything written down? I mean, does Management Council have a directive on paper of here is five o'clock rule, but chairman prerogative? I just want to make sure if somebody comes from the public and issues a complaint, I mean, a legitimate complaint, we have something to fall back on that says, you know, we try our hardest, but here are the general tenets of what we follow that is in place. It's in Management Council policy, Mr. Chairman. I just know my concern when I'm chairing a committee, I take over the Zoom and have LSO make me a co-host. So I'm bringing people in when I want and leaving them in the room. Um, and it is always difficult leaving someone in the room because you know they're done testifying, but it might be an agency director. Um, and some people don't turn off their camera. I mean, you, you kind of nice. It's weird to have to ask them they're done to turn off their camera because otherwise a YouTube link has them. There's four of you and they're just sitting there watching the meeting. and so. Kind of have to nicely put them back in the waiting room um, but i don't know how many other chairmen i watch other committee meetings and they say who else is in the waiting room oh let's let them in and it takes 12 to 15 seconds i mean it, it takes a whole half an hour if you have an important topic just letting people in and out of the room and waiting um, and i don't know if chairman training I, I guess my ultimate question is at what point do we ask the chairman to take that responsibility on as being a chairman to also be managing kind of the online virtual world, or is that something that we don't want chairman doing? Because um, right now I think some chairmen like myself are doing it. 
Um, and I like having kind of that control, quite honestly, of here's who I want in what order next, instead of asking LSO, bring in me the next person. Because I know, you know, I'm looking to the eight people, I know which side they're on and what they're gonna say usually. So do we need a better policy? Has anybody else asked for that? Am I the only one on telling chairman that they're in charge or chairman prerogative again saying, <coughs> LSO, you have to run this for me. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that it's fair to say that each uh, committee handles it in a different way. You are certainly more uh, hands-on than a lot of other chairmen are. Um, there are some that prefer to maintain the room and keep that order while staff handle all of the technology pieces. Um, and there is there is a, a delicate balance to bringing enough people in so that we have continuity and we don't have that delay um, and making sure that the room is not flooded. For example, you could bring in two or three people and as you're bringing them in say I'm going to listen to Tom, then Mary and then Joe so that they know um, as they're coming in what when they're going to be speaking. So there's different ways that we can manage it and we can certainly come up with a system. Um, that uh, makes that a little bit more smoother for the chairman that don't want to um, handle the technology while they're still trying to, to handle other things. Um, Maybe I know that there training. are. We could put that in the two hour chairman could. training of 10 minutes. Okay. And I know because there's still a 10 second thing, right? When you pull somebody in, they actually don't know what's happening. And you may, I, I know some chairmen are talking to them while they think they're being pulled in, and I'm like, they can't hear what you're saying. Um, they, and they don't know they've even been recognized. They just get shown up in the room and deer in the headlights. And, so. and it has improved. I'm, I'm sure you'll recall when we first started using Zoom, they were also on YouTube, and we had that infinite loop where they would talk to themselves for four or five minutes before they got started. Um, so we've done the best that we I can thus far with those that are coming in. I'm sure that we can provide them some additional instruction. And yes, I don't see that it would be a problem to uh, make sure that the chairman are aware of those types of delays and uh, as we move forward. Okay. Any public comment on Zoom? Those of you who are in charge of bringing people into the rooms and out of the rooms and chief clerks. I'm not sure the chief clerks get this much fun um, in the Zoom world, but I know um, Ms. Hubler, Ms. Talbot. Get that enjoyment. All right, not seeing any other comment on that topic. Thank you very much, Karen, for being here. Thank you. Next up is streamlining work and email management. Mr. Chairman, this was also an item that Senator Steinmetz had asked to bring up. Sure, go ahead. Senator. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Well, I've been hearing a lot, <laughs> a lot of banter lately, but um, just a way we were talking a little bit about a way we could kind of, we are, are all thrust into the digital world. And so like our emails, ways that um, possibly we could kind of streamline if it's from another legislator, that somehow it's bumped up in priority, especially during session, things that you need to know. And maybe this is just rules on individual emails, but as I stated before, some of my panelists' links are going into my clutter, and I think a lot of people are dealing with this, and uh, the guys on appropriations I know have been talking about it, and that's where some of this has come from, is we all get so many emails during session that if there was some way that we could try to I know staff and other legislators are maybe green on our computers. Yours aren't. Yours I'm are. Green. I think mine are in green, but um, maybe not everybody's are. And so there, we feel like we're missing emails and things. And we know that um, our digital workload has become more and more, and yours has too. And so just ways we could maybe streamline that. I don't know if there's ways to make rules for things to go into folders and maybe we just need training on how to do some of those things and manage some of those things. But um, I think it's an important conversation to be able to serve our constituency well and in this um, environment. So 
Any ideas on that would be helpful. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Steinmetz, we've looked at different ways in the past. Um, the challenge with folders are is if you don't necessarily use the folders yourself and the way you organize your business, you'll forget that it's just like the clutter, for example. You got an email that's in clutter, but you never look at the clutter folder. So you don't see the email. Um, what we had done in the past, and it sounds like this might actually still be set up on your computer, is anything from myledge.gov had a green font. So it wasn't going in a folder, but like when you're looking at your inbox, it kind of stood out from all the other emails because uh, we had a real setup where if an uh, email was received from myledge.gov, the, the font color would change to green. And it didn't do anything or move the email or anything like that. It just had a different indicator for a legislator. And we can look at doing that again. Go ahead, yes. Well, Mr. Chairman, are all the computers set up the same or do you do you have different roles on everybody's or is it that um, with, you know, some of us who have been here longer, did we have our computers set up differently and and then will they all be set up when we replace and have new computers or how does that work? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Steinmetz, that that was a rule that we had set up quite a while ago. So, and we haven't done it with the new com computers. Um, so if you had it in your Outlook profile, it probably carried over. But um, it's actually, if that's something that you want us to do, this is a perfect time to do it because we are issuing new laptops and it is a unique rule for every single laptop. It's not like we can set that up globally for the office, if you will. Um, it's, it's something that needs to be set up for each individual on their device. Uh, Chairman Wilson, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to say, the, so mine doesn't have that interesting green font feature. <laughs> and I'm in my 10th year, so I'm not sure why that didn't happen. Um, and obviously at this point, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, <clears throat> You know, there there are various options. I've in the past sometimes set up various macros so that, you know, if you get, when, when you get 200 emails on, um, you know, trapping baby bunnies or something, you can send them all to, but I, I did check with Jamie several years ago because um, the, the clutter collection is pretty robust, at least on mine and I think on all of them. And I've had I've experienced emails from the governor's office in the clutter bin, emails from my own email to myself that are in the clutter bin. So I just have to like every three days read my clutter bin, but I, it's easy to forget that. So, and I don't think that that is something because I, my recollection is that what Jamie said was that you really had to either turn off the clutter cult feature entirely, which is horrifying to think of. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer on that other than to just say, mine's not green. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Mr. Chairman, uh, sure. Representative Wilson, yeah, that clutter is either you have it on or you have it off. And um, stuff goes in there. I, I don't even quite understand that folder myself because, I mean, all of you are in the wildedge.gov domain. And to me, like any email from within our own domain, there should never go into clutter. Um, even for the example that Senator Steinmetz talked about from Zoom, we've whitelisted that Zoom email account, so it will never get blocked. So I don't understand why those go into clutter either. I don't know what kind of algorithm Microsoft has for that folder. You know, Mr. Chairman, um, it's sort of a mix of like, you can have so much uniformity in all our systems and, and the IT could kind of try to force that uniformity. Um, but a lot of it is the send it settings on the particular laptops and every program has its own settings and every program of different vintages has a little bit different. It's, it's kind of a nightmarish thing. And you know, you, you get trapped where you say, I can't figure out how to do this. Why 
why did this move? You know, I bet you get questions like that all the time. I can't find this anymore. It was there. And it's, it's these things are so complicated and my fingers are so big, I screw up a lot. And, but it's, it's hard to think that there's a fix where uh, that, that could be centrally maintained the same. And if, even if it could, people wouldn't like it because we have very, very savvy legislators that want to change everything. You know, I don't like that to appear there. I want it over here. I want it. Uh, I want this to happen when I do this. And I think it's the, the best solution to all of this, I think, is to have a friendly IT staff that will answer dumb questions and won't tell you that the question is dumb. That's like mm -hmm. sometimes that's the best. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, you know, if I any legislator comes up to us and say they're overwhelmed by their emails or any way that we can organize this or whatever, we try to work with them individually. Uh, but I think a perfect example of, the, say, the green font thing on the email, when you got to make that change on 90 different laptops, if Representative Wilson never had the green one, it's probably because we missed it. It only updated on 80 of them or whatever, you know. Um, but it's it's tough when you have to update on every single individual computer. Not to say we can't do it, but there probably is times where we might miss one of them. But if a legislator really wants some help with setting up a rule for it to go into a folder or to change the caller, we can work with all of them individually and do exactly how they want to organize their work. Well, Mr. Chairman. Um, so then question, would that be a lot for you to do to, to put in the green font on every computer when they come in? Are you doing work on those or do you just, are you setting up email on every one of those when they come in now or do they just kind of go out to us and they're pre-programmed and ready to go? Would that be a big lift? Oh, it would just be one of those check items that we would do when you get issued your laptop because first you would have to log into your Office 365 account and then set that up on your account. Uh, we can't just do it without you already being connected and all of us, obviously, we don't know your passwords for that account or anything like that. So if we were going to do it, I'm not saying it's a heavy lift at the time of issue. It's actually the time to do it is when we give you your laptop, the new laptop, ask if you want it done. And if you want it done, just do it at that time when, when we're issuing the laptop. Mr. Chairman, could we have you guys do that then at least ask the folks so that they know it's an option for them and then because I think it would help them set, sort their email a little bit and then during session it's a lot easier if say director Obrecht or our chief clerk sends an email we can see it. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Steinmetz, I, I could absolutely add that to our checklist of when we issue those laptops to ask that question if if they want help on setting up any rules for their email and we could do it at that time. Mr. Chairman? Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, were you? You know, uh, it's sort of unfortunate. So green is a color that's most difficult for colorblind people, which are usually men to see. <laughs> it's really a common uh, colorblindness in particular light for, for men. It's real common. Um, and uh, it gets confused with blue and black and um, sometimes, but uh, I'm not sure I would want that feature or that, you know, it's just, uh, I've never really had this problem in my own way. I don't think I've ever lost official email. There's too much of it. And some of it I deliberately don't pay attention to. And I confess, since nobody's listening, I, I kind of hate the SharePoint system, and I don't. Any, I, I hate doing anything on SharePoint. Don't even go there. But um, I never really have trouble with the emails. But if I ever somebody thinks I should have done something, and I didn't do it. I always can blame it on the email that I didn't get it, and it works really good. But I really don't have the problem. That's a confession. Nobody heard it. Senator Cost, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, you know, in having dealt with a lot of technology and a lot of the different issues and, and some of the things that you guys have brought up about so many different things and all, 
I think of people that are coming in new that won't even know what they want and what they don't want until after they've had their computers for a while and get generated into what's working and then they could contact our tech. I, I think we've got to be real, um, I guess, understanding of the huge amount of work that our tech people have to do and what all they're involved with. And some of the things we ask them to add might be a really not that important. And I think that we've got to be careful about what we ask them to do all the time. Email can be certainly worked on by individuals at any time when they want. And if they have troubles, they can certainly go down and talk to tech. And they've always been more than gracious to help us. Uh, I just want to be careful what we add on their plate because I know they've got a lot of stuff that they're doing. All right. Well, with that, Jamie, if you'll kind of at our next meeting or during session, after all the new legislators are getting technology together, what concerns they may have, complaints. Um, I know I think other legislators kind of say, hey, you can do rules and you can do macros. And there are some ways that some more tech savvy legislators use uh, on their email systems that and we I think we encourage internally some of our colleagues try this try this go ask LSO if they can set this up for you and um, but if you do find more efficient ways to make the workload easier and make sure we don't miss any emails that are important yeah. we're always trying to make sure we hear from all the right members of the public and our Ch chairman Wilson Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few parting thoughts then, because I will actually have to leave early as well. Um, maybe part of the training could be to reassure legislators that it's not necessary for them to use reply all for everything. <laughs> I wish we could get That's a really chip good one. in their brain. <laughs>
Oh, we're back. All right, welcome back to the second half of Legislative Facilities Tech and Process. Next up, we're going to talk about process. Please welcome Director Obrecht from LSO. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about remote participation at interim committee meetings, but let me check if there's anything else um, to discuss on that topic. No, Mr. Chairman, I think we, uh, you all covered that well. I would just say that we will review our internal policies on, or practices at least, because there's no real policy on it, on how we send out meeting invites with that link. I, and I, I like Senator Steinmetz's idea of trying to embed that always in, in the meeting invite uh, with the calendar on it. And I did that for the few that I actually do, not really knowing that it was a good practice or not, but but so we'll, we'll uh, We'll get it some uniformity on that within the office. That's easy enough to do. Seeing no further comments on that portion, let's jump right into 22.1, uh, Joint Rule 22.1, um, and just kind of review of where we are. And I'm not sure if it's how long it's been in place. I don't know, almost 20 years now on um, how we handle concerns and complaints. Um, but if you'd go over 22.1 with us, and we'll see what we can do to. Um, bring it more up to date in today's environment. Um, Mr. Chairman, thanks. Uh, I think Joint Rule 22-1 has been in place for uh, between 10 and 15 years now. Um, and I think it originally started with former Speaker Tom Love now worked on this uh, to get this in place prior to um, a period of time where a lot of complaints were coming in against a particular legislator for what could likely be viewed as legitimate legislative activities, primarily. And, um, and so why it's titled ethics complaints, it actually uh, deals with every complaint that uh, involves legislative misconduct as it's, as it's defined within this rule. Um, and it creates a process and it's a formal and rigid process for dealing with these complaints. Um, and as my time as director and previous to that as legislative counsel, I've um, dealt with a number of these complaints now, a, a number, dozens actually. Um, and a lot of them will stem, will be multiple complaints stemming from the same incident. Um, and, and sometimes this process works great, and other times it, feels woefully inadequate to actually address um, and give the presiding officers and um, the members who are tasked with deciding on these complaints the tools they need to handle them. Um, and, and so, you know, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the select committees, we go through this. I don't have any real recommendations for you today, except that um, one recommendation may be to management council to consider forming a group to look at this particular rule and then bring it up in um, probably in the 24 session, 2024 budget session for consideration for amendments uh, to this rule. And it could even wait until the 2025 general session uh, when it wouldn't take a two thirds vote to actually amend it either. Um, but. I can walk through this and um, talk about some particular suggestions um, or, or areas that I've noticed um, that uh, you know may want to consider for some amendments. Um, the first is the way that the complaints are received. Um, shall receive written signed complaints from any person concerning um, misconduct involving legislative duties. Um, I've always interpreted that and every presiding officer I've worked with has interpreted that as requiring that we actually receive um, a wet signature, that an email complaint doesn't meet this rule, the written signed complaint. Um, if we wanted to do something different than that, we, we would need to um, amend that portion of it. The next is um, when we receive the complaint, it is immediately provided to the member against who the complaint is made against so that they um, 
are made aware of that complaint and can begin to respond to it. Um, but I me, mean, can I stop you? Is, you bet. Is the person making the complaint known or just that a complaint against the legislator has been made and the topic, if someone wishes to remain anonymous, is that allowed or not allowed? Mr. Chairman, it is allowed to remain anonymous if the complaint is one of a, the nature where um, either it's of a sexual harassment nature um, or a discriminatory nature. But if it is, if you're alleging legislative misconduct on um, a conflict of interest, then it has not been uh, traditional to allow that complainant to remain anonymous. Um, and, and, and the complainants are made aware of that when they um, are filing the complaint. And how it'll usually happen is somebody will reach out to the presiding officer or to LSO and they'll say, um, hey, I want to file a complaint against legislator X for comment Y or for potential um, conflict of interest Z. Um, it makes its way to me and um, and then I send that person an email or I talk to them. I include a copy of Joint Rule 22-1. I talk to them about the requirement um, for it to be signed in writing to me before it can be um, acted upon by the presiding officer. And then I also let them know that the complainant will know about this complaint unless otherwise protected under legislative policy or rule. Um, so if we move down to, to A1, um, it's the definition of misconduct involving legislative duties. Um, it's a violation of Article 3 of the Wyoming Constitution, Ethics and Disclosure Act, any of the Wyoming conflict of interest statutes, violence or disorderly conduct during legislative meeting sessions or during the performance of legislative duties or bribes or offers of bribes. Um, what this leaves out is any action that's not taken within your legislative duty, but may still be unbecoming of a member of the Wyoming legislature and may actually disqualify you from service in the Wyoming legislature in the eyes of your peers, if they decided that. But um, let's say that a legislator committed vehicular homicide um, while, while inebriated happened in another state and you couldn't actually file a complaint under this provision and be it and have it be actionable so a member of the public wouldn't have an outlet to do that now i'm not saying that another member of his house couldn't bring an action and couldn't ask management council to start an investigation but if you're not in session there's not a clear path on how that would be done outside of this rule so that would be something to consider um, uh, also, um, you know, only violations of Article Three. What about the rest of the Constitution? Um, it, so that would be uh, another thing to consider. Um, violence or disorderly conduct is broad. Uh, disorderly conduct, especially, um, you know, no further definition of that in in this rule. Left to the presiding officers officers initially. Um, section B, um, well, let me back up, sorry. Uh, paragraph two, an investigation instituted for political purposes and not connect, connected with intended legislation or with any of the matters upon which a house should act is not a proper legislative proceeding and is beyond the authority of the house or legislature. I think that the point of this was to, you can't do a witch hunt under this provision, but it's actually quite limiting then to what the presiding officer could do. Um, and um, that may be another provision that could be looked at. B is kind of our um, motion to dismiss standard um, and it's narrow. 
Uh, the presiding officer, after consultation with the majority and minority floor leaders, may summarily dismiss any complaint which on its face appears to be frivolous or submitted for any improper purpose. Um, this does happen. Um, complaints do get dismissed under that standard. Um, but usually what the reason they are dismissed is um, is if the remedy that's asked for or if the allegations as alleged don't arise to legislative misconduct. That's when they get dismissed. Um, so I, whether they're frivolous or submitted for an improper purpose, hardly ever get touched upon. That would be if it doesn't go back to Romanet 1 under under a right yep yeah mr chairman that's correct okay so unless under uh, paragraph c unless the complaint is dismissed under uh paragraph b which we just talked about it's sent to um the members of management council from the house in which the, the member um, that the complaint is lodged against. And they form uh, a first committee that looks at this to decide whether there's probable cause that um, an actual that legislative misconduct occurred. Um, and some of the complaints I've dealt with have gone this far. Um, and, and this process is a little looser. Um, the member against who the complaint is lodged can provide evidence and a written response to the committee. The committee can decide what other evidence it wants to take in that matter. Um, and then if the committee decides after taking that evidence, whatever evidence it decides to take, that um, there wasn't probable cause of legislative misconduct as it's defined within the rule, they can um, then dismiss the complaint at that point in time. But, and here's the catch in my mind, if they decide that there is probable cause, and the way they decide probable cause is um, it's laid out in C1 on the top of page two, is whether a factual situation is sufficient to warrant a reasonably prudent person informed of legislative procedures and duties to believe that a violation or other misconduct has occurred. Okay, so um, so if they find the probable cause for, let, for a misconduct has happened, their only remedy at that point in time, the only action they're allowed to take is then to forward it to this select invest, investigative committee, which creates this quasi-judicial process with um, the right to be represented by counsel, the right to present evidence, and all of it in, happening in public. And um, Mr. Chairman, I guess I would submit to you that not every situation that involves a legislative misconduct as this is defined, is that necessarily the appropriate end result for a group of legislators that a public display of, and, and it leaves the presiding officers and the members of that committee with very limited tools to help address an action. And so I think that that would be probably more than anything, what I would suggest if, if you wanted to recommend to council and if council wanted to take it on, a way to figure out how to give those, that body multiple choices on how to deal with, with this alleged misconduct at that point in time. So, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Director Obert, um, so what are the forks in the road that come to mind as possibilities? I mean, to uh, here they can either say there's nothing or they move it on, right? And you're looking, you're suggesting that, you're not making a suggestion, but it, it's possible we could put some intermediate kind of actions in there within the purview of this 
this committee, mm -hmm. which is management council from the house that the member is from. And what could those look like? Could those be things like, you know, I know in different companies and things, uh, if they have policies about infractions, sometimes it's in regard to dis discrimination policies or sexual harassment, and they have um, ways that the person can come under kind of closer supervision and work their way out of it with good behavior in, in a way. I mean, um, I suppose there are other things, um, but it's hard for me to think of what the options we'd be looking for are, are there. Yeah. So uh, help me with what the art of the possible is, not necessarily pinning you down to say that's a recommendation. You, you bet, Mr. Chairman. And first, I would acknowledge your point, and, and maybe we should start on this basis. I should have let off with it. Whenever you talk about legislative discipline action, it's difficult. It is. it is difficult and there's a reason it's difficult because you're an elected member and any action especially if it doesn't involve the entire body mm -hmm. to limit your ability to represent your constituency or somehow compromise that ability should should um should be difficult and that's how our constitutional scheme is set up for that um but that being said, it would be, you know, another way to look at this procedure is if we had a public process, a public investigation, that maybe we would do more damage to that legislator's um, reputation and his ability to represent his constituency or her constituency than if we handled these things um, in a more discreet manner or have some more ability to handle them. Um, Mr. Chairman, what I would uh, reference is the, the different options that we provided that um, Management Council provides within the sexual harassment and discrimination um, policy. Um, things like additional training, um, things like counseling. Uh, you're right. Um, uh, also, other, you know, recommending the presiding officer um, takes actions necessary to ensure that the complaint upon uh, behavior doesn't happen again. And all of it um, with the understanding that if the member doesn't agree to do uh, and take those uh, remedial steps, those corrective steps, that then the full investigative process would happen. Um, but, and, and so I, I don't think that's the full universe of what could be considered, but I think it's of that nature. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, I, I guess I've been involved in a few of these now where if it went to that process, the situation would have the potential to be much worse than what we were dealing with at a lower level. And it put the members and myself, frankly, advising them in, in, a, in a difficult position at that time. And I don't think that was the legislature's intent in adopting this rule. I think we haven't really talked about it, but some of these complaints are not uh, private, right? There are big spectacles where something bad has happened or alleged to have happened, and the complaint, the complainer certainly wants the public to know they have made a complaint, or even if they have not made a spectacle, the media, somebody picks up on it, and a complaint is generally known, right? That it's been submitted, whether or not, um, you know, you can confirm or deny that, and everyone's waiting for some resolution. I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that that's not necessarily true. There are private issues and there are public issues, and there are places where people are making hay politically about the behavior of a legislator. There are also private situations, and, and um, I have tangentially connected with some of these complaints that he's talking about over the years. Some are very private. Maybe the action was public, but the, the fear among the legislators, legislators for their safety or because of something that was said online or just also worried about the mental state of the individual or just on and on and on. Those have more private aspects than 
the very public piece. And so some of these are approached to the director's office and to management council in a very private way. Some come publicly, we all hear about those, um, but it kind of is both, I expect. But I, 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 am I on the right track? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's um, a very accurate representation of the universe of these complaints that I've dealt with over the years. Um, the, the complaints that are almost universally private are those that involve a, a, of a sexual harassment or discriminatory nature. Now, in, in a rare occasion, those will become public, um, uh, but usually those are private. And that's why, as a matter of fact, we've created um, a database of those with non-identifying factors so that, you know, so the public can have access to how many of these are being filed each year. And, um, and, and that's, that's why we treat it like that. It, to Chairman Zwanser's point, there are times when the complaint is made for a political purpose, potentially. Um, and um, there was a case of a former senator where the complaint was sent to LSO and the Senate president at the same time it was sent to the newspapers. Um, and the Senate president, after dealing with that complaint through the Senate members of management council and um, uh, finding that there wasn't probable cause to believe that um, legislative misconduct occurred in that case, issued, uh, treated their response as a public document. Um, that's not always how it happens. Um, in fact, you know, the rules really contemplate that, um, that the complainant and the person against who the complaint is lodged um, don't have to keep the complaint private, but that the people investigating it, and definitely LSO staff, have to keep it private, and we do, and confidential. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would also just point out that I was involved in one complaint um, where it, it was a serious matter, and um, but it didn't, it clearly didn't involve legislative misconduct as that term is defined. And um, the senator, the, the president of the Senate who, who overheard that complaint decided to still impanel the, the probable cause subcommittee, the members of management council, and give the complainants a forum to be heard. And then to help uh, make the complainants realize that that those members did take their complaint seriously. They didn't think that they were filing it for any sort of frivolous reason, but there were reasons why the Senate couldn't act on that complaint. And they didn't just involve this rule either. I mean, there were constitutional issues associated with that complaint as well. And I had heard after that from those complaints that they felt so validated to be given an opportunity to be heard. Now, it's not universal. I mean, you know, the, they, I think they still would have liked punishment against that member too, but um, but to, to know that they were taken seriously did mean a lot to them. And that is a structure that this rule does provide. So where I was generally going with my, you know there are some public complaints, there's not a timeline necessarily of, of chronological 30, 60, 90, 120 day resolvements, which I think does frustrate people when we know that there are um, complaints. I think there's one currently, and last I knew in the press, whether it's right or wrong, was um, it will be handled by session with no understanding of what, if any, resolvement or when or if it will happen. I think that's the difficulty some people have. They issue a complaint or people do know a complaint's out there. Um, there's not even a finality of, yes, it's been dealt with. It's, we got the complaint and we really can't tell you any more. And so is, have there been other complaints about the process to, I mean, when the media says, hey, how many sexual harassment complaints against legislators have happened, do we keep that information, whether they're, I mean, I guess they're all complaints, whether we deem them legitimate or not. Do you track the number of complaints each year and is that public information? And how do we gauge um, that when the media or interested members say, 
I want to make a complaint, but do you tell them somebody else already has, I guess is another interesting question. You say, oh, there, there's someone in line before you has made a similar complaint, so, or do you just let everybody make a complaint and then they pile up from the same incident? All of those questions at once, Director. Um, Mr. Chairman, your first question is, is there any time frame in which to address a complaint? No, there's not. No, no time frame laid out in the rule. Um, and I would say if there's no immediate uh, danger or um, the, the resolutions of these complaints can take a, a fair amount of time. And um, and it, it's due for a multitude of reasons, but I could understand someone's frustration with with that. Um, I would also say it just is part of the nature of a citizen legislature. Um, as to the other question, we do keep a database of um, of all complaints that have been received by LSO. And, and um, I think we go back to, you know, it, it, it's by no means complete prior to 2015, but I think we even go back to 20 to 2000 with our database. And those are in the aggregate with no identifying information, but it is whether it was an ethics complaint, whether it was a complaint uh, about sexual harassment, um, and, and the media can and does often request that. And that was something when um, Management Council updated the sexual harassment policy three or four years ago that was put in at that time. So committee, I guess the question is, do we want to recommend specific changes, recommend Management Council look at the policy? Do we think the policy is working um, and just, you know, we know that one size approach won't fit all, but this is as good as it's going to get, or do we think we need a hard look at a rewrite or a restructure or bifurcation for certain levels of, of complaints that come in? Um, okay. Mr. Chairman, there's, there's no clear answer, but, but it seems that a hard look is appropriate, and, and uh, it's actually... Um, you know, we have some really good staff and some really good staff that might be emeritus that might be pulled in to help management council or this committee if they want to designate to us but it, it'd be better for management council probably because they actually implement it um but to look at revising this to look for um possible options in the process that, that fall short of you know there's only two things that can happen. Eventually, if, if it's uh, founded, it goes back to the bodies. And you can, by a uh, two-thirds two vote, you can expel a member. Has that ever happened? I'm sure it has happened, but it's not, it's never happened on my watch. By a majority vote, you can deny privileges to the member. Um, and that has happened. Um, so, I mean, that's where this thing kind of ends up. There could also be, it leaves out the external world. It leaves out law enforcement. It leaves out uh, civil remedies that, that someone could have. Um, I mean, it, I think this would be educational in this day and age just to look at this, even if we don't change it. But I think, I think we probably would make some tweaks. But it's a big lift. It's like, it's a two-year lift. It's not a... It's not like, oh, I recommend these changes right here. No, it's a lot bigger than that. And looking at the policies around the, the other states. And the one that's not even addressed very well, and we fumbled with this in the past two years, is social media. I mean, honestly. Actions taken in social media. Um, some people look at the social media posting of someone and are feel threatened by that. I mean, physically threatened feel that it is a very direct threat and act uh, encouragement of violence or whatever. We've had this happen. Others think, oh, it's just a social media. It's just rhetoric. It's just uh, that gulf is so vast. And, um, you know, definitely had members of the Senate 
fear for their personal safety against social media posts of another member. Pursue this up to a point and looking for an avenue outside of this, including uh, public, putting it in the record and making uh, using the journal as a tool to get it out to the public. And then reconsider that at the last moment because they were actually worried perhaps that there would be, um, uh, uh, there were possible good reasons for that involving some of the mental states of people involved. I mean, that's as close as I can come to telling you what happened. And, and that was really serious. There were people who were really afraid, afraid to walk into the Senate floor and cast a vote. That should not happen. In the, and so, I mean, so I would hope we would recommend a good thorough look at this, both in terms of our traditional solutions and in terms of how it relates to our modern age. Um, and I think we've got good people on the team. I think we probably need to investigate uh, yeah, how other states do some of these things. And we did a little bit of that on the social media kind of informally. But, um, you know, other states are very co concerned about what members put on their social media that is uh, insightful to actions. So anyway, I throw it out. I say, let's come up with a recommendation and, and suggest further look, not suggesting a solution. Do you need a motion for that, Director Obrecht, or you'd carry that message on from us? I think we're all- Well, I would make it a motion if, I'm happy to listen to discussion first, but I would make a motion that we open an investigation of this. I'll do that at the appropriate time. Well, you can do now. I guess we can ask for public comment, if there is any public comment regarding these issues from anyone in the gallery or online when it comes to ethics complaints against legislators. Okay, I guess now is the appropriate time, Senator. Yes. Well, I would, um, I don't know how, how to do this other than to be very uh, generic and open and say, can we review this policy of 22 whatever and, and seek staff input on possible uh, avenues to revise the policy over a long-term effort under the auspices of the Management Council? And so basically we're recommending to Management Council that they embark on a an analysis and a possible revision of 22, whatever the number dash one, dash one um, including specifically to uh, think about the implications of social media, but certainly not limiting it to that. Okay. Seconded by cost online for the discussion. Not seeing any all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The motion carries. You'd carry that message to Management Council for us, Director Obrecht. Um, I yeah. sure can, Mr. Chairman, and um, they'll discuss it at their meeting on the 24th of uh, this month. So if anybody wants to be there for that or appear via Zoom, that would be great. We could, we could, we could back you up um, or back up the recommendation. I think it might have, it might be more appropriate than just saying you're the water boy and you go deliver this message. <laughs> this is what the tech committee, the process committee. That it'd be more powerful if, if members actually came. That that would be great, and I believe you will find a um, sympathetic vice chairman um, with the management council. All right. Next up, the manual of legislative procedures and management council policies. Are you walking us through that one, Director? Yeah, that's okay. me too, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, your manual of legislative procedures is actually, after your rules in the Constitution, um, the next level of precedence on interact or on actions of the floor during the session and interaction between the two houses during the session. And this also includes uh, standing committee proceedings too. It's supposed to be updated every four years and then voted on by the membership. It hasn't been updated since 2004. So two years ago, um, my immediate uh, past predecessor, Dave Groover, um, came out of retirement as he will do from time to time <laughs> and, um, and worked on updating that manual. 
And with the directive from the president and the speaker to also include um, in that manual some of the historic precedent of the Senate and the House on how issues are handled. And I think, um, you know, what really drove that home for us was um, in the Senate, per rule, you can uh, have a motion to reconsider in Committee of the Whole. In the House, you can't. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a representative when I was the House attorney come in and ask, hey, you know, I want a motion to reconsider on Committee of the Whole. And I said, well, you can't do that. You know, it's clear in your rule here that you can't do it. And uh, another past LSO director was there at the time, Dan Pauly. <laughs> and he said, actually, I think I know how you can do that. And he said, this is to divide the community yes, the whole report. Yes, you can yeah. divide the community. You weren't ever supposed to tell that trick. That was a <laughs> secret trick just known to a few. <laughs> <laughs> so um, because of the loss of institutional knowledge at LSO and because of a lot of the, the more frequent turnover of legislators as well, um, they asked that some of that historic practice be put in, in the, the manual. So um, that manual has gone through two years of review. Um, it will be presented with the changes to management council on October 24th. And then what council will do is only recommend those changes to the joint rules committees of the Senate and the House. And then if, if the Senate and House rules committees uh, approve those changes, they will then be presented and voted on the floor within the first five days of the 67th legislature meeting. So, um, but it got Dave Groover and I thinking that really because that manual, and, I, and I'm also proposing rule changes associated with this manual, the Senate rule, um, I think it's 1-1, one does a great job of defining and determining when um, changes can be made to the manual. And the, the changes can only be made upon a majority vote of the members of the Senate. Well, the House is completely silent about when the manual can be changed. And the joint rules are actually um, potentially in conflict with the Senate rules on when changes can be made. They say that those changes only have to be made upon recommendation of at least changes to the joint rules of um, the, the joint uh, rules committees of the House and Senate. It doesn't have to be presented to the floor. So um, the subcommittee that reviewed the manual of legislative procedure is going to recommend those two rule changes as well, that the House and the joint rules conform to the Senate standard. Um, but if we do that, um, you know, over the years and, and, and probably as a symptom of, of being a legislative or a part-time legislature, we have got all sorts of handbooks, manuals, and management council policies. And a lot of these policies and manuals actually deal with proceedings of one or both houses or their interactions with each other. Um, and really, it's not appropriate for management council to be making those decisions without the House or Senate weighing in on those and approving them. And I mean, I think we all know why they made those decisions. The decision needed to be made. Nobody, you know, we weren't in session, so council made those decisions. But really, they should be brought before the bodies, and the body should consider those. Um, and if you go through the management council session, I mean, you know, I, I just highlighted um, a half dozen that seemed appropriate right off the bat for inclusion within an expanded manual legislative procedure. Um, absences during session and whether you should waive your salary or whether we should ask a member to waive their salary. I mean, is, is it for management council to make that? you know, recommendation. Um, dress code in the chambers. Council makes those decisions of what the appropriate dress code is, but really it should be up to the bodies. Um, floor ceremonies that are appropriate in the House and Senate. Um, policies uh, concerning legislative aides, interns. Um, remote participation and streaming of legislative committee meetings. 
Um, these are but a few. The um, council has um, had a made a policy on over the years that really should go into that manual or should go into before the bodies in some form. And I think council would be open to uh, exploring that again, I think probably a two year process and it's broader than that, or at least it could be broader than that. That manual, um, we could hopefully eliminate some of our other uh, manuals and handbooks, wrap those into the Wyoming Manual of Legislative Procedure. And also, I mean, what, what we hope um, you get out of that is then more of a buy in from the entire body on, hey, here is the decorum we set in our galleries. And there's a reason we set that decorum and you all got the chance to vote on that decorum. It wasn't an edict from on high. And um, even if you don't agree with it, in a, in a representative democracy at the end of the day, you got your vote on. So, um, so Mr. Chairman, that is it. Uh, would just be another recommendation to council um, to consider this, and again, probably the manual, um, it wouldn't be ready for another two year period. I think we'll look forward to, hope, oh, Senator Simons, but I would hope they would involve legislative process uh, in that discussion, certainly. Go ahead, Senator. Mr. Chairman, I would, uh, when at the appropriate time, I'd make that motion that we look at sub separating that out yeah, and maybe we need to hear from the public at all but it I don't think it's healthy the way we've gotten so uh, detail orientated with with the management council work and I think it bogs them down and I think it's better if we just got the buy-in I think the buy-in is really important I think they'll like this idea too I think they really will and uh, you know it gets cluttery if, uh, and this would give us a chance to look at some of those issues and, you know, any proposed changes would be divisible, of course. You could, you know, there are changes to the rules. We could have a discussion. Might take a little while when it's finally adopted and done, but we've handled big lifts before. And uh, I think it'd be really healthy for both bodies and for, you know, our, even our, our session staff and regular staff. I just think it would be the public, it would be a very healthy exercise. So I'll second your motion when you get around to it. Let me see if there's any public comment before the motion's been made, but knowing that it's coming, any public comment on those thoughts? Seeing none, I guess now's an appropriate time, Senator Steinmetz, to officially move that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would move that we would ask the Management Council to um, look at our their handbook and um, parse out those things that should be in our rules in both houses and make a recommendation as to what should be voted on and what should be management council policy. And maybe if we could just friendly that we're looking for them to kick off an investigation it would it would be a long period of time at least a year maybe more yeah and, and come up with the list of things they think the body should should move to the, the rules of the bodies. That all sounded friendly? Yes, that's a friendly amendment, unless there are things that are glaringly obvious that we need to take care of at this session. I mean, if there's something that really stands out and it's a no-brainer, then we might as well handle it now. I'm, I'm good with that too. The session. Okay, all that's the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those say no. That motion's passed. Um, Director Elbert, there's one more thing on the agenda, I believe. Just clicking too many pages here. It is, oh, the report from Senate and House Chief Clerks, yep. which is probably not you, but there's anything else while you have the microphone you'd like to share. There, there is, Mr. Chairman, and just um, so the select committee is aware that um, House Chief Clerk Wendy Harding retired, and um, I don't know exactly when her retirement was effective, but she's been still, um, yes, we're still paying her. Well, I don't know, actually. Maybe Wendy probably isn't getting paid for this today, but she certainly can be if she wants to. Um, but her, um, her replacement has been named as of October 1st, Katie Talbot. 
Um, LSO uh, legislative editor will also be wearing the hat of house chief clerk. And um, that she was um, appointed by Speaker Barlow with uh, the consent, and I would probably say enthusiastic consent of the majority and minority floor leaders as well. So um, that's why Katie's gonna come up and with Wendy and Ellen and discuss, um, yeah, any procedural changes they would like to see. I just have a question. Go ahead. Is this the first time that anybody can recall where we had regular staff that became a, kind of a session staff clerk too? That's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm, I'm just, because it's always been someone kind of in the, in the session staff orbit that comes up through there. Yeah. yeah. My just, first chief clerk was Paul Galleros. Right? Yeah. The house also lost our assistant chief clerk this year retired. So it was a, been a difficult year over in the house. Or, um, with that, though, come on up, uh, Ms. Talbot, Ms. Harding, Ms. Thompson. And congratulations. And thank you very much, Director Obrecht, for presenting that and kicking us off. And I know, Ms. Thompson, you already shared a little bit, so maybe we'll just continue with you if you have any other updates for this committee of things we need to be working on to help you out. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Um, just, I just made a few notes of things I wanted to go over with you today uh, based on you asking for a report. We have uh, begun session staff planning meetings with LSO um, as of last, this past month, September. We'll be meeting once a month like we normally do until December and then as needed after that. Uh, training for new members has been scheduled and we'll be participating in that along with um, faculty from um, leadership and other members as appropriate. I think there's some people from NCSL, the usual kind of um, session we have for new members. And then all member training is scheduled for the ninth, the day before the session begins. Of course, the chamber required some rearrangement because we are adding a new member. So we will be accommodating the 31st member and I have asked that all desks be turned parallel to the front desk. So the way we're accomplishing that in the Senate um, with approval of leadership was to add a fifth row on both the uh, north and south walls um, and the center aisle will remain the same. The outside aisles will remain the same and the center will have four rows. Has that work already been completed, do you know? No, it has okay. not. The desk not has okay. <laughs> the desk has been moved in. Mm -hmm. um, I think we had originally looked at adding desks on the sides, but we had had some experience with that at Senator Case will recall. That was less than satisfying. So we've come up with this solution to accomplish both the addition of the new desk and turning all desks to the front. Uh, the other item uh, for the Senate chamber will be adding monitors to the walls. Um, you'll notice in the Senate chamber on the north and south wall, there are some plugs on the wall high up and those were intended to be monitors, but up until now we did not have approval for those and we did receive approval for that. We're waiting to confirm that the additional support is in the walls to hang those monitors. And the IT staff um, has thankfully been working on some um, ways to show the calendar on that, those monitors during session so that we would see if we were on second reading, all the bills on second reading and whether or not those bills had amendments, which would be very nice. I think a good addition to the chamber. Uh, and also um, eliminate the portable devices being brought in because those you know, had cords and they were tripping hazards and with the additional desks up front, there really isn't room for them. So. Um, I think that 
will be a nice addition to the chamber. Uh, Mr. Obrick mentioned the Wyoming Management of Legislative Procedure updates. We, we also, the clerks provided input to that. I have to say, I think the House beat us out when it came to memorializing all of the unique little things that they do. Um, but there were some differences, of course, and now hopefully that's a repository for all of those changes that we provided input to. Uh, in terms of staffing for session on the Senate side, we've had a little bit of musical chairs going on in staff, and it's the very first time um, that we have not had a waiting list of people interested in coming to session staff. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've looked a lot at w what causes that. Um, the changes in the jobs due to technology, I think, has been a challenge for us. As we talked about previously, all the intricacies of committee meetings now with the Zoom element, the remote testimony element, um, we're asking our people to do more. Uh, the hours have been difficult for a lot of people um, with evening committee meetings going sometimes on the Senate side till 9, 10 o'clock in the evening, and daily session pay. So Senate staff, session staff, are paid a set amount per day, whether that's six hours of work or 12 hours that they're there for the day. So we're still attempting to fill three openings, um, and we're, we're actively recruiting in the community along with some um, help with community organizations as well. But we hope to have everyone on board by late November and then train in early December. But you'll see changes in the floor team, the entry team, and the secretary team all on the Senate side. Uh, we've already talked about the new voting system. Adoption of Mason's manual. This is another area where we are still using the 2010 version. We're trying to get to the 2020 version. It will require a rules change, but in addition to that, there are a number of rules that reference Mason's sections within our Senate rules, and all of those have to be cross-referenced and checked. And I, I'm just about done with my review of that, and then I'll turn it over to legal. So that's something else I would anticipate we may see. And when I attended the clerk's conference last month, I found out we weren't the only chamber that hasn't yet adopted the, the 2020 manual. So there's a lot of people in, in the same boat. Uh, the last thing I had on my list was, we're gonna be proactive again this year in surveying members. Uh, coming in about, you know, their preferences. Do you want paper bills, paper amendments? Do you want a second monitor on your desk? You know, all of those little intricacies um, and differences to try to not be wasteful with copies and staff time, but then also meet the needs of the individual members. So um, we'll be doing that. And I, I've really recommended to new members, or in the past I have, you might want paper to begin with, but then if you find out this is too much and, and the paper gets overwhelming, then we can take it away. But it's easier to add them in at the beginning and then take them out if, if they find they can do without the paper. So, any questions of me? I actually um, think it's a fabulous report. Um, I think about about how the, the legislative process has changed all these years, and how, I think this committee's done working with all these folks to really make things cool. But um, I might it might be time to reverse the paper paperless thing. It might be time to say that the standard option is paperless, and that. If you want paper, we can provide it and force them to learn it. Um, and th that's just, that's a thought that I have. And then you opt into the other option. You'll know right away. You'll either get it or not. Um, <laughs> 
I'm just thinking of the extremes on the Senate floor, and we have more extremes than you have. <laughs> we do. And we always have uh, one senator who still has the rack of bills from when I first started, you know, and he'll, he'll have it forever, so, and so be it, and it's okay. But how that senator finds stuff when he needs to find stuff, I really have no idea. And when I started out, this is too much reminiscing now, but we actually would cut out the amendments and tape them into the bills. And we had these little scissor things that you just rolled across a page and it clipped it out and you could tape it on the page of the bill. And you had, and we did that in those big racks, but I am dating myself. Um, so, but uh, the other thing is, we had some confusion this past year about roles sometimes it got a little confused we have relatively new officers in our in our body and they're doing a great job but i think there was a little bit of confusion between some of the roles of the officers and a couple of different occasions which threw me off i think one was uh like which officer does what the job for example in terms of introductory votes or in terms of managing committee of the whole and um we had a few days of confusion on that and i I think it's been cleared up, hasn't it? And if not, I'd be happy to help with it. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Case. I, um, we are reviewing the uh, leadership handbook, handbook um, because we wanna have that ready for the upcoming session. So um, I did look in particular and did not find introductions in mm -hmm. either the role and responsibility of the Senate President or the Speaker of the House. So that's something I'm going to be talking with LSO about, um, perhaps some new language in that um, manual to make that a little bit more explicit. Um, I do think it was a, an effort to be collaborative on our leadership too. part. You bet. Um, I don't think it was nefarious at all. And we were able to go with the published list with the exception of one bill that did get moved up in the order of yeah. introductions. But we did get through all of them that day. So I don't think it hurt anything. It was just a little concerning that we had a published list and we were trying to change it at the last minute. And it, it did cause some confusion. I apologize for that. But I, I think we're, we've got it straight, and we will be more explicit in the manual, I think, in terms of the duties, so that that's a little more spelled out. And Mr. Chairman, I, I think that's a fabulous way to handle it. I think we forget how much the public depends on notice of getting something. And just knowing that it's going to come up today or coming up to, in the morning, they want more notice than that it's probably going to be the next item of business after or before lunch or you know and having those lists published and available are really important it's important we follow them absent you know they're always wrecks and we need to but but i just think that's really important thank you such a good job you do chief clerk talbot i just wanted to say that out loud and former Chief Clerk Harding, go ahead, Wendy, if you'd like to start. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Well, as uh, Director Obrecht uh, announced, I have retired. So the House is kind of in a little bit of a transition while I am uh, working. Katie and I are working really hard getting her trained so that she will be up and ready for the 67th. Um, the other changes that that you'll see for us, you know, we have two new representatives with redistricting, so our house chamber is going to be refigured just a little bit differently. You know, we're going to be a little more crowded, but it's going to I think it's going to be a neat change and actually our desks are pretty much where I think they're going to be. We have the addition of another historical table which I think is really going to be beneficial for the members. So we'll have two tables now up in the front, and we've actually moved um, some of our staff. I've, I've called it the COVID corner all these years. I've had three staff members 
virtually sitting on top of each other. So we're spreading out our house staff just a little bit so to give us a little bit more room. Uh, and that, that has enabled us to put the tables out in front and bring another historical table in. And on those tables, we are going to be putting those historical lamps that uh, we've not actually had up on that front desk because they're kind of a vision blocker. So if you have a chance, look at the chamber because it really, it's turned out nice. There's gonna be a few more tweaks, but it looks really nice and I think it's going to be about ready to go. As far as the process this last year, I'll address Senator Case on this. I am really proud of what we did in the, the House. We were virtually paperless for our amendment process, except for the budget. And those were the only amendments that were printed and distributed on the floor. Everything else was paperless this year. We had 23 members that were totally paperless, which I think is, I'd like to see those numbers more, but uh, hopefully we'll get there. It is, it would be my goal, and I hope it, I hope Katie will be able to um, relay this to the new members that are, that are going to be elected to try to go electronic because it, I was impressed with a couple of them last year that were, or the last two years that were new. They wanted to be all electronic, and um, I think it's, kind of the way we need to we need to go. I do understand that there's going to still be reps that will go down and print off their amendments off the printers, but we're still not using nearly the reams of paper that we have used in the past. And I think that's just so important. I can remember when we were at Jonah uh, cleaning out the desks, we literally filled the hall <laughs> and it was taller than I was with the stacks of paper that came out of the desks. And it took A and I, I don't know how many days to come and haul that paper off. And so I'm really pleased that we're not going through nearly that much paper anymore. And I think another thing that has changed a lot for the house is that we no longer have the clerical assistants that did their filing. And so I think that enabled the representatives to not rely on that paper as much because they didn't have somebody to kind of clean up their mess. So they, they're not using as much paper. So that, I think that's one of our greatest accomplishments that we've done in the house this last year. And other than that, um, unless you have any questions for me, I'll turn it over to your new chief clerk. Seeing none currently. New chief clerk, anything you wanna add? Mr. Chairman, um, committee members, I don't have much to add, of course. I have to thank Chief Clerk Harding for a tremendous amount of time and patience that she has spent and will continue to spend. Um, and thank Chief Clerk Thompson in advance, because I'm sure during session I will be leaning heavily upon them for help. Um, I'm looking forward to the 67th. I have an awful lot to learn and kind of a short time to get there. Um, but other than that, really staffing is kind of our concern right now as well. Um, we have several positions in the house that still need to be filled. Um, and so, you know, we're begging friends and family and all sorts of things to, to help us out with that. But um, that really is all I have to add and um, looking forward to it. Hey, Senator Case. Just, um, will your role be the same as the old chief clerk, even though the uh, traditional chief clerk, all the same roles, plus how will you, will you have any LSO ongoing responsibilities at the same time? How, how would that work? Ms. Talbot? Remains to be seen, I suppose, but at this point, I do plan on um, staffing committees in the interim um, and up to about, you know, that session prep. Um, point in time. Right now, Clarissa Nord from uh, Research Eval is going to be taking my committee load for the next, oh, I guess through um, November. And then in the early interim next year, I'll take over. I'm assuming I will assume my, my legislative editor duties. And Mr. Chairman, just I think everybody's always surprised how much personnel obligations you have as the chief clerk. And the, the there's so much work to that job. It's just incredible. And then uh, do you have an assistant chief clerk yet? You know, I do not. Um, and I think that, well, yeah, John the Reader um, has been serving that role with okay. Wendy for the last number of years also. So um, that's who I'm going to be leaning on, obviously, too. But okay. um, so I think I heard earlier that, uh, that 
Oh, okay. I guess the leadership secretary. Oh, okay. Misunderstood. Well, anyway, you're going to do great. I've, you know, able help to the committees I've served on. So you're going to be great. And thank you for your service. It's been a pleasure to work with. Thank you. And I'm glad you're sticking around. <laughs> Any other public comment regarding the clerks, floor duties, or anything else? Not seeing any, so with that, we'll adjourn this meeting, and I'm not sure we'll have another Legislative Facility Tech Process meeting in 2022. Um, so if not, we'll look forward to seeing you all in 2023. Enjoy your evening.